Oh, let's talk Red Sox baseball. It is oh, raining. Let's it's talk Red Sox baseball. No, I've got. Lemire's. What, 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 what say you? Well, another setback yesterday, Joe. Lucas Gilito, our one free agent starting pitcher acquisition. Yep. Elbow injury, likely out for the season. That's going to be determined in the weeks ahead, but quite seems like Tommy John surgery. Uh, another another setback for a team that seems destined for last place. And we will see now, Mike. Uh, do they? There are still a couple of free agent starters out there. Blake Smell, Snell, Jordan Montgomery. Do the Sox go in? They will not go for Blake. I think Snell. Snell's going to the Giants. I think. They will not go for Blake okay. Snell. And but Gilito. what about Montgomery? Thank you. Montgomery's wife works in Boston. Yeah. Yes, she does. She's a, on, it's a good fit. She's an intern, in doctor at, at one of the local Boston hospitals. Yeah, and he's lived in Boston all winter long. Right. I don't know what they're going to do with Montgomery. I strongly suspect they'll end up not signing Montgomery. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, is, is this because their goal is to be in last place five out of six years in a row? That's not their goal. That is their destination. But th that but is, that's the well. reality. Yeah. How, can I ask you this question? How do you own the Boston Red Sox? And make them last place five out of six years. Do you know how hard that is to do in this age? Easy for us. We've done it easily. Well, yeah. Easy. No, I mean, they're making it look easy. <laughs> you know, right. they, they have a, a fairly decent uh, minor league system now, and they're banking mm. on several guys mm. in the minor league system who might be up sooner rather than later. Mm. That's not a great thing to be doing, especially when you're a franchise. How did this happen, that, Mike? How did this happen? How did we record? get to the point where we're going to be last place five out of six years? I don't know. I do not you know. Don't know. That you don't know. You watch every game. I do not know you the answer to that question. You are called the mayor question. of Fenway. How did this happen? I do not know the answer to that question. Oh I really don't. I do know that this would probably be, most likely would be Alex Cora's last year there if they continue on this. Well, path. yeah, if you're Alex Cora, you're like, hey, listen, I'll go down with a Titanic five times, but seriously, but I'm getting a little waterlogged here. I'm not going to do it six times. Yeah. And I do think that the, there on. is, I, I fear that the Red Sox ownership is, is unaware or underplaying the fan anger. And even, look, they signed Jordan Montgomery. They're still probably fan finishing anger. fifth, but like it would be a fan. sign that we're trying. And we're, he'll be on the team for a couple years as we start to rebuild. But right now, this is, this is a franchise that has really disappointed its fans since the Mookie Betts trade, and people are pissed. And they're, they're going to be empty seats at Fenway this year. Uh, yeah, empty yeah, seats. Yeah, yeah. You, I, you know this better than anybody. You can't mention that deal in front of me. I know, Mike. I'm sorry. That was a trigger. Okay. I should have okay. given you a warning. I'm going to get to the sorry. headlines That's now. The tragedy as I of all. I know. Yeah, I know. Well, well, all right. We're, we're, we're so excited about the Yankees. Oh, and so it was playing great that I think we can challenge for third place this year in the AL oh, East. No, Obviously, no. Orioles, Jays, Rays are your favorites, but division. these scrappy Yankee Red Wait, Sox no. teams down low. Climbing the ladder. Where, where is Heim this year? Where's Heim Bloom this year? St. Louis. St. Louis. So, so let me ask you. Yeah. Are they going to be blaming him in St. Louis? Should we get, can we get a forwarded address? Because everybody was blaming Heim last year, which I said was BS all along. But are we going to now blame Heim Bloom? It's kind of like when TJ went to CBS and something would go wrong here, would still blame T TJ even well, though he's at CBS. Are we still going to be blaming work. Heim Bloom this year when we're in last place again? I think the plan is to blame Heim throughout this coming season. They'll blame Heim yeah. up until October when all the players go home for the year, okay? Because yeah. there'll be no October. Ball yeah, the certainly yeah. Not. And then tough. by then, by the beginning of October this, yeah. this year, this coming year, yeah. they will have someone else to blame. So Haim will be put on the shelf yep. okay. and they'll have someone else They'll to blame, blame TJ. Go ahead, Mika. Let's I'm read the news. I'm going to do the headlines now. Right. Uh, morning papers across the country will begin in Georgia, where the they're, they're writing about how the Red Sox suck. Constitution <laughs> right. Everybody, even the AJC. <laughs> <cyber> <laughs> they're the first on a health care oh, system is causing major oh. disruptions across oh. the country. Change oh. health care, a substantial Subsidiary of the United Health Group <laughs> announced its payment system was hacked on February 21st, leaving hundreds of providers unable to get paid for their services. The Department of Health and Human Services says it is working to alleviate the financial pressures, pressures for some of those affected. They, they, they believe, actually, they have a suspect. His name, Heinz. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, the Star Ledger has a front page feature on new, uh, new charges against New Jersey Senator Bob Menendez. A superseding federal indictment was handed down yesterday accusing the Democrat and his wife of obstructing justice. 
The indictment alleges the couple tried to cover up a bribe, making it look like a loan, and lied to their own lawyers. The senator now faces a total of 18 charges related to corruption and bribery. In Iowa, the Gazette leads with House lawmakers advancing a bill that would change the state's election laws. Legislation creates an earlier deadline for absentee ballots to be received. Bans absentee ballot drop boxes and limits challenges to a federal candidate's placement on the ballot. The bill passed the state house with all Republicans in support. Democrats opposed it, saying it would make it harder for certain Iowans to vote. The Republican Speaker of the House in Iowa? I'm blue. <laughs> exactly. Oh, there you go. And the South Florida Sun Sentinel reports the state plans to crack down on spring break crowds this year. Yesterday, Governor Ron DeSantis announced he's sending 140 state troopers to seven Where's to assist back? 17 yep. cities vacationers can expect to see more law enforcement in places such as fort lauderdale and miami beach over the next few weekends troopers will help with directing traffic crowd control and DUI checkpoints. So let me tell you, things have gotten so out of control yes. down that stretch, Fort Lauderdale down to Miami. We see it every year. You'll see uh, kids coming down. They'll do coke. There'll be fentanyl in oh. there. We saw, I think, some West Point kids. Maybe it was... Was it was it uh, the the naval service, service academy? academy? It was one of the but service academies. One of the service yeah. academies yeah. Uh, a couple of years ago getting in trouble. This is happening every day yeah. uh, down there. It's just been absolute chaos, especially in Miami. So the Miami mayor, uh, the, the Broward County officials, Governor DeSantis, basically said, "Come down here. <laughs> we'll be watching. Blank around and find out." Yeah. Which I will tell you, there there are relieved parents up and down. That coastline and yeah. should be across America that they're doing that because it had gotten so wildly out of control. You're talking about curfews on a lot of streets in Miami. It needed to be done. This was this was anarchy and chaos. All right. Later this morning, Nikki Haley will announce she is suspending her presidential campaign. Who did she blame? Uh, Hi, Bloom. Uh, okay. Jennifer Palmieri and James Carville will join us to discuss what is now the start of the general election rematch between Donald Trump and Joe Biden. You're watching Morning Joe. Coming up, NBC's Ali Vitale is live in South Carolina, where Nikki Haley is set to end her presidential. And we have no choice. Yeah, okay. Um, you know, it's, it's, it is, uh, okay. I will say that it is a decision that we revisit con constantly mm -hmm. in terms of the balance between allowing somebody to knowingly lie on your air about things they've lied about before and you can predict they are going to lie about, and so therefore it is just it's irresponsible to allow them to do that. It's a balance between knowing that that's irresponsible to broadcast and also knowing that as the de facto, soon to be de facto nominee of the Republican Party, uh, this is not only the man who is likely to be the Republican candidate for president, but this is the way he's running. Well, here's how we we'll balance it. Yeah. Why don't we fact check the hell out of him? Yes, and we do that after the fact, and that is the best remedy that we've got. It does not fix the fact that we broadcast it. But it's honestly. stunning that he's saying these things yeah. and people are hearing it. Let's just go through it, right? That we have the most devastating economy. Are you kidding me? We have had the best economic recovery of any country in the developed world. He's telling an audience right there, oh my goodness, the, the paltry oil production. We're producing more oil today than we ever have in the history of our country. Think about the American Revolution rescue plan, the infrastructure plan, we have created more jobs, 3.2 million more jobs than we had pre-pandemic. The problem that we do have is inflation. And so what Donald Trump does is prey upon the fact that people don't necessarily feel good and life's expensive. Mm. But when it comes to facts, here's something that's absolutely nonsensical and infuriating. When people's wages go up, they credit themselves. They say, I'm good at my job, I just got a raise. But when everything costs more, they blame the government. Right. And wages 
wages are up, which is a huge positive. And one of the reason wage, one of those reasons wages are up is all the union wins in the last two years. And remember, President Biden has stood with those unions. You know, we talk, welcome to the fourth hour of morning, Joe. Uh, you know, we um, we talked about how Neil Cavuto at Fox is fact checking Donald Trump's lies. Steve Ducey uh, at Fox will uh, fact check uh, the lies. Brett Baer often does it as well. Of course, Harold Ford, our friend Harold Ford, does it as well. Um, but but there, Willie, last night uh, we saw it on MSNBC. And it's just something that has to be done. When you have Donald Trump hating on America, saying America sucks, saying that America has the worst economy in the world, saying that our economy is a joke, when in fact, well, first time since the 1960s that unemployment has been below 4% for a couple of years running, talks about crime is just absolutely out of control. It is in some cities, really. And I'll tell you what, it really pisses me off that city councils won't pass the tough laws that need to be passed to make some cities safer. But overall, crime rates near a 50-year low in America. Just the reality. And, and the thing that really bothers me uh, so much is when he starts talking about how uh, our military's weak, when Republicans talk about how it's weak and woke, our military stronger by far relative to the rest of the world any time since 1945, the end of World War II. It's not even close. I will tell you, I've been fortunate enough to be able to travel around the world over the past couple of years. And yeah, they're worried about Trump, but nobody's going. Gee, I wish America would exert its influence across the globe more. No, they're pissed off because we're exerting our influence across the globe too much. America is strong. I've heard that from European leaders. I've heard it from leaders uh, in, in the Middle East. Like, America is out there. America is flexing its muscles. This is not like this, this, this lead from behind Donald Trump fortress America BS, right? I mean, this is a very strong, muscular America that it now has NATO stronger than it's ever been. It literally, NATO of 50, 60 years, stronger today than it has ever Adding been. Adding members. Yeah. Adding members all the time. And Ukraine, what is Ukraine fighting for? Be more like us. Wait, 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 wait. Why are all these people at the border? Why do they want to come into our country? They're not doing that to Russia. They're all leaving Russia. They'd love to leave China. They'd love to leave North Korea. You know, JFK said for all of America's problems, and we have some, we never had to put up a wall to keep people in. No, our problem is just the opposite. Everyone across the world wants to come to America. Why? Best economy in the world. Best promise for their children in the world. Best colleges in the world, best hospitals, best medical care in the world. If you're sick and dying and you're in the Middle East, you're in Europe, you're somewhere else, you can go somewhere there. Chances are good. They want to get to the United States and go to the Mayo Clinic or MD Anderson, one of the extraordinary hospitals we have from Boston down to New York, Philadelphia, you name it. And Donald Trump is telling that audience that we suck. It's just, it's my, not, not my, not mind blowing that he would say it. It is mind blowing that the party of Ronald Reagan that once believed that we were a city shining on the hill brightly for all the world to see, that that party has now embraced a man whose message is simple America sucks. Mm -hmm candidate and in that listless speech last night that victory speech he gave last night he said quote our country is a joke just think about that the guy who wants to be president again who wants to get back to the white house thinks our country is a joke trashes it at every turn says the world is laughing at us goes on and on and on and it's all fundamentally based on lies as you said about the economy about the military about immigration all these things that he that he talks about and there was another axios is reporting from the business roundtable takes a survey of ceos every year ceo confidence on the economy right now is through the roof 
Yeah. And they're expecting more capital investment. They're expecting to hire more. They're expecting the economy to boom through the end of the year. That's from CEOs. The Wait. stock market we haven't even talked about. Breaking <laughs> record records, highs. Breaking records all the time. So, Don, in other words, Donald Trump is telling a story that just isn't true mm -hmm. to create a reality, which is not true. Mm -hmm that he's going to come in and save us from, that he's the only man who can do this. But people know. They see there's data, there are facts. Yeah. They see through it. We've got Jonathan Lemire with us, great group this hour, professor at Princeton University, Eddie Gloud Jr., former White House Director of Communications to President Obama, Jen Palmieri. She's co-host of the MSNBC podcast, How to Win 2024, and... Oh, Democratic strategist. We're going to talk about some algorithms. <laughs> co-host of the Politics <laughs> War Room podcast, James Carville. James has all the algorithm he needs under that LSU hat right there. Uh, so, James, let's begin with you. Some reaction to last night, uh, to the results, to Nikki Haley dropping out here coming up in just a few minutes, and also to what we hear constantly from Donald Trump. Well, I just got to respond a little bit to the conversation I had before. The problem we're told is we have a lying criminal that makes stuff up, is running for president, and was president. But I think the bigger problem is the actual people that believe this. And the fact that he, you know, he's been documented and lied 30,000 times. But after all of this, in spite of all of the evidence, um, there are way too many people out there that, that believe what he says. And, you know, the country, it has to want to get better. And, you know, Jamie Dimon, Joe, to your point, famously said, no one ever went broke betting on America. You'd be, you'd, be a, you'd be a rich man today if your whole life you just doubled out on America every year. And we got to try to remember that as we go forward in this campaign. But he's going to keep lying, unfortunately. But the worst part, people can keep believing him. More from James in just a second. We do want to get to South Carolina because, as I mentioned, some breaking news this morning. Nikki Haley will exit the 2024 presidential race this morning in a speech expected at the top of the hour here. NBC News correspondent Ali Vitale is covering the Haley campaign in Daniel Island, South Carolina. Ali, good morning again. What more do we know? Good morning again, Willie. And if it had been 10 years ago, Professor Carvel could have failed me in his class for you cutting him off to come to me in Charleston. I'm thankful to be where we are now. But look, the vibe on the ground here is such that we are starting to see campaign staffers flowing into this headquarters. We know that this speech is set to start at 10 o'clock this morning. We expect Nikki Haley to remove herself from contention for the Republican primary nomination. Of course, we had seen these tea leaves last night as I was alone out here outside of campaign headquarters, the only campaign, the only network to be able to find where this campaign was hunkered down. We saw, just as we were leaving around midnight, people starting to bring in equipment that looked like they were going to be staging an event. Of course, that is now what we have confirmed and what we are expecting to see. In terms of what these remarks are going to say, I'm told they're going to be very short, but that Haley is not expected to endorse in these remarks. Instead, she's basically going to say to Trump, hey, the ball is in your court time for you to start to work to earn the voters back that I had actually won to my cause and I have to tell you over the course of the last year as I've been following the Haley campaign but especially coming into focus over the course of the last few weeks Voters across the country who I find at Haley events tell me by a two to one margin that they are not interested in voting for Donald Trump. What that means for them in November kind of splits off from there. Some of them say that they are going to just stay home. They don't want to vote for Biden or Trump. Others of them say that they will hold their nose and vote for Biden. And I'm not just hearing that from independents, although that is a substantial part of the Haley coalition that we've seen be built across many of these states. I'm saying that from people who tell me that they are lifelong Republicans who do not think that Trump should be the standard bearer of their party and that they could vote for Biden simply because of that. NBC's Ali Vitale covering the announcement just under an hour from now that we expect to hear Nikki Haley dropping out of the 2024 presidential race. Ali, thanks so much. So, James, back to you uh, briefly here about Nikki Haley, uh, about what she did over the last couple of months and taking on finally Donald Trump in a more frontal way, but also what we saw last night in many states, which was Nikki Haley, though she lost, only won the state of Vermont, picking up 25 percent, 30 percent, in some places 40 percent of the vote in a Republican Republican primary of voters saying we are not going along for the ride with Donald Trump. 
Well, yeah, that, she got some, I wouldn't call them impressive numbers, but it really exposed Trump's weakness. And he's a lot weaker than we like to believe. And, and uh, her donors stuck with her pretty good. I, they, they put out a list that you, you can hear in Louisiana, but when it was all inevitable for sure, it was a pretty impressive group of people that came out in support of her. So, I mean, obviously she's going to recede, but the 30% of the people that voted for her are going to have, a, it'll play a large part in this election coming up in, in November, depending on what they do. If they go, you know, stay, law, stay with Trump, do they vote for Biden, or they not vote, or they vote for a third party. I mean, there's some there's key, key demographic here. It's Haley vote, the 30% of Republicans that voted for Haley. It's going to be interesting to see where they go. Yeah, you know, James, uh, when Donald Trump was on his way to winning in 2016, you and several other uh, Democrats were concerned about the Democrats' campaign. Uh, I'm curious, uh, do you have concerns about the Biden campaign, their ability to identify the voters they need to get in Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, pull them out to the polls and beat Donald Trump in the states that matter? You know, Joe, I think that I know the people that are running this campaign, I find them all to be experienced. I find them almost a person to be talented. The, the problem, of course, with Biden, and we all know what it is, is he's got a, a huge issue to overcome in, in terms of his age. And I see these people getting mad at the New York Times for asking the question. Well, you, you can't answer a question until you ask it. And that's the big obstacle they got going forward. And I don't have a problem with the, with his campaign or, or Mayor Mitch or Mike Donald or, or you know, Clinton Folks or, or, or any of these people, but th it's a pretty daunting challenge they're faced with in, in terms of get people to see Biden as offering something, you know, yeah. some energy for the next four years in the country. Yeah, you know, uh, Jen uh, O'Malley Dillon, uh, really right. great, ran an incredible campaign in 2020. Yes. I know, I know they all have to feel really good about her being there. I'm wondering, so how do you address uh, the age issue? And I'm just curious. Do you agree with people close to Biden, people who've been friends with Biden for a long time, that maybe he's been protected a little too much? Let the guy get out there. Well, I mean, there's a decisions how much he gets out there have to be made by him and has to be made by people that interact with him every day and understand what the benefits and the risk are. But it's hard for me to sit here a thousand miles away and right. say, well, you should do this with him, but they are much more attuned to what he's capable of doing or, or not capable of doing. Uh, I, I thought it was telling that when he didn't do the Super Bowl interview, but, you know, to their credit, they came back and they put him on Seth Myers, which I think helped a little bit. But I don't, they, they, this is a, a, a big obstacle that they're faced with and they, they have to deal with it. Right. But the good news for the Biden campaign is Trump is very weak. He, he, you saw the exposure he has in the Republican primaries. You're going to see more exposure with this March 25th trial coming up in New York, a much underplayed event. Yeah. And he's not the most coherent person that ever lived either. Well, I'll tell you what, we're really concerned <laughs> for his health. Uh, and he's slowing down so much and looks, uh, I mean, the energy level is just completely collapsed and uh, gets lost uh, time and time again. Sometimes it just looks like he's short circuiting. So. I think we're all worried about the health of, of, of him. Democratic strategist James Carville, thank you so much. Uh, great to see you as always. That, that, thank you very much. And Ali Vitale, my former student, go get it, man. <laughs> there you that, go. That girl's killing it up there, man, killing it. <laughs> there you go. She is. All right. Thank you, James. You know, um, there, there's, such a, there's such a challenge for the Biden team because, as I've said here on the show over the past couple weeks, I've spent a good bit of time with Joe Biden. I've spent a couple of hours uh, with Joe Biden, sitting, talking, going around the world uh, as far as uh, 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 talking issues, talking the economy, talking inflation. Talk and I must say, when I was talking to him, my thought wasn't, oh, poor guy. My thought was, oh, my God, I wish Dr. Brzezinski were off the, uh, on the other side of the table right now because these two guys, I mean, 50 years of experience, and Joe Biden hasn't forgotten it. 
He may get pissed off at a press conference, and he may be thinking about uh, the Mexican border deal and say Mexico instead of Egypt. He knows what he's talking about. He circles back around, gets to Egypt. He, he might misplace a word here and there. But you talk to him for hours at a time. Is he slower? Does he move slower? Yeah, he's moved slower. Uh, is he stiffer? Yeah, he moves stiffer. He's had trouble walking sometimes? Yeah, so did FDR. We got out of the Depression. We won a GD war against, against Nazism and, 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 and against the Japanese. But comparing that guy's mental state, I've said it for years now. He's cogent. Mm -hmm. But I undersold him when I said he was cogent. He's far beyond cogent. In fact, I think he's better than he's ever been intellectually, um, analytically, because he's been around for 50 years. And, you know, I don't know if people know this or not. Biden used to be a hothead. <laughs> Sometimes that Irishman would get in front of the reasoning. Sometimes he would say things he didn't want to say. This is and and and. I don't really, you know what, I don't really care. Cut. Start your tape right now, because I'm about to tell you the truth. And F you if you can't handle the truth. This version of Biden, intellectually, analytically, is the best Biden ever. Not a close second. And I've known him for years. The Brzezinski's have known him for 50 years. If it weren't the truth, I wouldn't say it. And you read the New Yorker interview, don't think it's going to make a huge difference in Oshkosh, mm. but if you and, or the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. But if you really, if you want to know the truth, if you really give a damn, if anybody out there gives a damn about the truth, read that interview, and you'll sit and read through that and you go, "Oh my God, there's just no comparison between Joe Biden and Donald Trump." Historians will look back and they, they will say. Why was this race close in February, in early March? Because it makes no sense. And you've been around Biden enough to know. He, he's not going to he's not going to run a 4 2 2 at the combines. No, <laughs> but he might damn well save Western democracy from Russia. Yeah, all of that is right. And the challenge now for the Biden team is to change the narrative because that's not the story that most Americans believe if we are to accept the polls, that they are more concerned about Biden's age than Trump. Senator Chris Coons of Delaware, one of Biden's closest friends in the Senate, he this week was like, we need let, to let Joe be Joe. Let him be out there on the road. Let him be his best self. Uh, and Jen Palmieri, there's a major opportunity looming this week to start changing that storyline. And that is the State of the Union Thursday night. The president will follow that with some campaigning in Philadelphia and Atlanta, two key states. But what kind of message, and perhaps in the, in the world we live in, with where we, optics matter for a lot, what kind of performance does Biden need to deliver on Thursday to start changing the narrative so American people can see what we were just talking about? I would say, like, first of all, I would say, like, I feel really optimistic after coming out of the presidential primary season for, uh, for the Democrats and that Trump can consistently does not get Republican votes. You know, 20 to 40 percent of, of Republicans are still not voting for him. Uh, there, there is no energy. There is no anti-Biden energy in the Democratic Party. If that was going to happen, that was going to reveal itself in New Hampshire. Uh, Biden is not getting all of his votes from 2020. That means he has room to grow. Trump has like kind of tapped out. He's at 93 percent, according to the New York Times poll, of, of his supporters from 2020. So he doesn't have room to grow. Like I actually, and the White House, he is, you know this, I mean, the president is out there more. He takes questions from be. the press. <laughs> Starting to, that's fair. Um, I mean, in the last four or five weeks, he takes questions from the press multiple days a week. Um, you saw him, you know, you saw him on Seth Meyers. You saw him taking questions, you know, at the ice cream situation, not the best to talk about uh, Gaza, but still, he's taking questions of that. And there, there is, there's been a ton of battleground state travel, and there's going to be more, right? Um, if they're going to amp that up. They're going to double that in the in the coming days. Um, but then, I think for the State of the Union, he can set, you know, at the. We did a thing on the circus when Trump. Oh, excuse me, God, I'll say that Biden went to Israel. Um, of footage from him from when he was 29 years old, Senator with Indira Gandhi, mm -hmm. all through time as Senate Foreign Relations Committee Chair, Vice President, President of the United States. And you're like, this, of course, he has, his whole career, his whole life has been building to this 
moment to be this president and, in the United and States, way, and Jen, he is ready to do it. When does it pay off? It pays off when um, America has horrible relations with China, President Xi comes to San Francisco, yeah. and Joe Biden can go out there and talk to a guy that he's known since they were both the number two in their country. Right. And guess what? There's no sort of measuring the other person up. There's, there's a familiarity, and they sit down and they talk through it. And my God, how remarkable progress is made. Our militaries talking to each other again. Yeah, I mean, and, and trying to navigate Ukraine and then Israel and Gaza. And so I think Biden should project that tonight, tomorrow night, that, that level of experience and walk us through what he inherited and where he brought us. That's sort of the context that's been missing, I think, in terms of uh, economic uh, accomplishments. And then, of course, where are we going to go? Right? Hey, hey, Laid a great foundation. Where are we going to go? That's the piece that's been missing. Can I just say, it's such BS. Here's the lie that... Joe Biden is running against, other than the big lie and all the other lies here. The lie that things were magical under Donald right. Trump, that yeah. the economy was better under Donald Trump. Before COVID, everything was, no, it wasn't. Before COVID, Donald Trump was ranked seventh in president since 1960 regarding economic growth. And by the way, this, for some reason, oh, there's this past, we're not gonna talk about COVID because of course COVID was bad. Yeah, COVID was much, much worse because of Donald Trump. Absolutely. Why can't we say it? At a time when we should have been taking more precautions, he was telling people to put bleach in their veins. He was telling people if there's some way we could just put lights under the skin, they'd be okay. Like doing all of these stupid things. He made, whether you're going from the right or the left, Donald Trump made all the wrong calls on COVID. Somehow that has been lost. Yeah. That, the, mm -hmm. that the way COVID turned out in this country was inevitable. It was just a fact that it was the way it was going to be. That's not true. No. Go back four years ago to downplaying COVID. It's one case coming in from China. We can go on and on and on down the list. He could have had his moment. The guy he talks about being a big CEO, a big strong general, a big leader, and said, "We're gonna. here's what we're going to do. We got to shut things down for a little bit. We're going to figure out. We're going to race to a vaccine, which his administration did actually. Yeah. And we're going to get through this together. He chose not to. He chose stepped aside and said, "We're it's just going to take and, care and of itself." And if he'd been a CEO, he could have <laughs> instead of just like lying about it, killing hundreds of thousands of people by lying about it for as long as he did, and then, you know, panicking and shutting everything down. A real CEO would have looked at it and said. Okay, there's a real problem. Let's figure this out. It's moving fast. Yeah. People are dying. Let's figure out Let's what we're going to do. And then he could figure out, a real CEO could figure out, you know what? Doesn't make sense. We're learning. This isn't the, the 1919 pandemic. Mm -hmm. We're learning. Younger people are okay. Let's reopen the schools. Those kids, they, they, it's not like the 1919 flu where it was the young people who were all dying, right? A real CEO... A real leader could have done that, but Donald Trump couldn't because he was so invested in life. It's no worse than the flu. Mm -hmm. It's going to go away by spring. There are only 12 people in the country that have it. President Xi, Donald Trump said, is doing a fantastic job. Thank you, President Xi, on behalf of the American people. Why does he get a free pass for that? Why? And ironically, probably cost himself the election by, yes, allowing, that, by allowing that to, to, to happen. So, Eddie, this Wednesday after Super Tuesday is a great time to kind of take stock of where this presidential campaign is. Nikki Haley is going to get out on the race in about 45 minutes, we understand. Uh, so now we officially sort of have this two-man race. The President of the United States gives the State of the Union uh, on Thursday. What is your sense of where things are right now? Do you share Jen's optimism about Democrats? <laughs> not quite, not quite. I think, I think at the heart of this is going to be a turnout uh, uh, election, right? And that is to say, you say that Trump has tapped out. Uh, what I notice is that you got the 20, 20, 30, 20 to 30 percent of the Republicans who say they're not going to vote for him. And then we have to worry about those uncommitted folk, whether or not they were in Wisconsin or whether they're in Minnesota or uh, Biden's base. Right, the sense that Biden's base is kind of worried, not just simply about his age, but also about Gaza. And you know, Joe, I think the age thing registers on two levels. Mm -hmm. There's the age issue around competence, mm -hmm. and then there's the age issue around a generational gap. Mm -hmm. 
okay. that, that, is, that somehow he's not connecting with those younger voters. These the issues that define our period. He's not even a baby boomer. He's before them, right? right? And so there's a sense of disconnect here. So I think at the end of the day, in terms of the election, how will these two will the parties turn out their folk? Will Donald Trump be that machine to bring those disaffected voters back to the polls? I don't think so. And yeah. will Biden excite finally excite his base to get out I mean, in the way they should? Be? Here's the other thing: Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Arizona, Nevada, Georgia. 2022 races, Democrats won. They are like yeah. fresh off of this. Yeah. I just, I have a ton of faith in the turnout operations for each of those states. And so like, I mean, that's the other thing. These people are battle ready. I mean, I was in Michigan last week. There was a Republican convention. It didn't actually happen because fist fights were breaking out. Right. And so they called off the Republican convention and yeah. I don't know, let people vote virtually or something. Right. So like that is, you know, that's what's happening mm -hmm. with the Republican party. And well, that's, and, that's and, and Willie's brought this up too. Arab Americans, Muslim Americans, obviously concerned in Michigan with what's going mm -hmm. on in Gaza. They yeah. should be. Palestinians, you know, people that get upset at, at, at Congresswoman Tlaib for doing what she's doing. They don't understand American democracy. She's a Palestinian. She represents a Palestinian American. She represents Palestinian Americans. They have a right to be heard. They need to be heard. They have been heard and they understand now. Like I think I think they're starting to feel like the Biden White House is hearing mm -hmm. them pushing uh pushing aggressively ag against Israel. But Eddie, I mean as Willie said, here's a guy that said, "Oh, you know, let's just finish finish the problem off oh, yeah. in Israel." Mm -hmm. Basically just Let's just finish the problem. Just wipe out Gaza. That's what Donald Trump's saying. The same guy who, who uh, against all advice, uh, you know, moved the, the, the embassy to J Jerusalem, instituted a Muslim ban, talked about a Muslim registry. On this show back in 2015, we said, wait a second, a Muslim registry? This is Nazi Germany. In 1935. So it's not like after looking at everything, uh, Arab Americans, Muslim Americans in, in Michigan are going to go, yeah, that Donald Trump, he's going to fight for us when he's saying basically wipe out Gaza. No, I think that's absolutely right. When you make the contrast, when we make the contrast, it's clear that Trump, Donald Trump isn't the option here, at least for, for, for Biden's base or the base of the Democratic Party. That contrast has to be made. It has to be made at the level of detail. Right, in terms of those kitchen table issues, right? The yeah. issues that actually confront these folks. So around student loan debt, around voting rights, ar ar around the various ways in which freedoms, as, as Kamala Harris, Vice President Kamala Harris has been talking about, have been under assault. So I think you're absolutely right in this regard. But I think at the end of the day, it's the question of whether or not folk are going to actually turn out in large numbers. Will we see the numbers that we saw in 2020? And we, we shouldn't underestimate the animation behind people who are going to vote on choice. Reproductive oh, absolutely. So that is going absolutely. to be significant. And every election since Dobbs, the Democrats have won. And add in IVF now. <laughs> oh, my IVF. God. This is the party that wants to stop IVF. That's the, the, the message. And by, and by the, the way, a couple of you say, oh, no, no, we don't. And then the bill. Yeah. Yep. They, yep. they wanted to pass a bill in the Senate, and Republicans killed That's it. That's right. right. That's so right. it's still out there. Yeah, it's staggering. Some other noteworthy results on Tuesday night. NBC News projecting now that Democratic Congressman Adam Schiff will face off against Republican candidate and former baseball star Steve Garvey huh. for Senate in California. That's interesting. Schiff held off Democratic rivals, including Congresswoman Katie Porter and Barbara Lee. Uh, Adam Schiff propped up. Uh, Steve Garvey, this is the outcome he wanted. Now he goes head oh, to head really? against a Republican. He got Republican. a cast hold. A lot of fall. Yeah, a yes. lot of apples. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, that was brutal. Yeah. And we'd have, we'd have Claire on. She goes, oh, no, I'm not doing anything. I don't know. <laughs> she and, was and then, and then like, he got the cast hold. <laughs> and then afterwards, Claire said, yeah, we put $2 million in his race. <laughs> yes, she did. In Texas, Democratic Congressman Colin Allred beat out eight challengers to win the Democratic primary there. He now now will take on Republican Senator Ted Cruz in November, which will be a fascinating race. Already focusing his campaign largely on reproductive rights, as just mentioned, an issue Democrats believe could help lead them to victory in that state that is trending more purple. Trump won Texas in 2020 
by nearly six points. That was down, though, from his nine-point win in 2016. And down from Barack Obama's, I think, I think Barack Obama lost the state in 12 by maybe 14 or 15, 15 points. Yeah. 15 points. So it's gone from 15 to nine to, I checked, five and a half. And Ted, remember, Ted Cruz <laughs> just barely got past Beto O'Rourke in 2018, his last race. Close election. He beat O'Rourke by just two and a half points there. So that's a, a race to watch. In North Carolina's race for governor, Democrat Josh Stein and Republican Mark Robinson wow. easily won their party's primary, setting the stage for an wow. expensive and high-stakes November contest. Stein is the state's attorney general. Robinson, the state's lieutenant governor, vying to replace term-limited Democratic Governor Roy Cooper. Republicans are prepared to tie Stein to President Biden, whose approval ratings are underwater in the state. Democrats, though, will hmm. paint Robinson as an extremist, and they don't really have to do How any painting. How hard will that be? He's painting himself. They will attack him over a number of past controversial comments. Among them, he has attacked school shooting victims, questioned whether the Las Vegas massacre was real, has suggested 9-11 was an inside job, the moon landing was faked. He also repeatedly employed anti-Semitic tropes, suggested black Americans should pay reparations <laughs> rather than receive them, mm. also repeatedly derided women in offensive terms. And of course, Donald Trump endorsed Robinson over the weekend, calling him, quote, Martin Luther King <laughs> on steroids. Mm. So, um, mm. at what we're talking about percentages. I, no, listen, you're covering I, your mouth. That I didn't no, know. no, no, some no, no, no. There, 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 <laughs> but, but wait, there's more. There's so <laughs> much more that you take a state like North Carolina. Like I would say, North Carolina is a state that you know. By the time it's over, I would say you know Biden. Lost it by one and a half points yeah. last time. You know, maybe he loses it by one and a half or two if he consolidates everything. Because um, it's trending Democratic. But a candidate like this, and we've seen this before, a candidate this crazy certainly can cost everybody up and down ballot a point and a half, two points. And the fact that Donald Trump has endorsed this guy and called him Martin Luther King on steroids? <laughs> Let me tell you something. There are going to be some 30-second ads. There are going to be some TikTok ads. There are going to be some Instagram reel, reels uh, that, man, are going to burn through North Carolina like crazy. I've, I mean, it's in play now. I mean, I know that Biden has always believed in North Carolina, but now, like, that state is truly in play, too. And also, there's a 12-week abortion yeah. ban that the state passed. Yeah, and, and you know, overrode the Democratic the governor. And Robinson said, let's get that to six. And then he said, and keep going from there, suggesting a, a complete ban. He also, by the way, we could add in, called the Holocaust, quote, hogwash, called the civil rights movement, quote, crap, and said that Beyonce is satanic. Quite a resume he's built there. What, he, he didn't like the country song? What was it? Oh, that's a great song. Texas is, Hold'em. Is that not a great song? Catchiest song in years. Nika plays it every morning. She should. It's that good. All right, let's bring in North Carolina's Dances Attorney to General. It till the dog stops her, but go ahead. Now the Oops. Democrat Party's Democratic Party's nominee for governor, Josh Stein. Mr. Attorney General, thanks for being with us this morning. We can talk about your opponent in a moment, but first let's talk about you, how you won in North Carolina. You've done it before as Attorney General, beating a Republican in 2016 to get your job as Attorney General. How do you run into Democrat in the state of North Carolina and win? You talk about what you want to do to help people. And if you're trying to solve the opioid epidemic or you're trying to make neighborhoods safer or you're trying to improve our public schools so that our kids can, can learn and get the skills they need to succeed or you were trying to make our health care system work so that people can access and afford the care that they need. If you work on real problems that make a difference in people's lives, voters will give that uh, give you credit for that. and. Uh, what's interesting in North Carolina is the largest voting bloc are unaffiliated. It's unaffiliated, then Democrats, then Republicans. And so people really aren't interested in the partisan labels. They just want results. 
Attorney General Stein, this is Eddie Glaude. So you're right to talk about these particular issues, but what do you do when you have an opponent like Robinson? How do you muster the kind of response to what will come out of that campaign? I know Josh Shapiro congratulated you last night. He ran against Mistriano, who was a similar kind of candidate. How will you, in terms, in terms of Robinson, how will you respond to what you know inevitably is coming down the pipe? Well, the, the voters of North Carolina could not have a starker choice in front of them. And what our duty, our obligation as a campaign is to make sure that people have the information they need in order to make the right choice. I, I have spent my entire career fighting for people and delivering for them. Whereas he fights the job killing culture wars. And that's why we're out there trying to get as many resources in the door as we can. And if people want to learn more and support our efforts, uh, joshstein.org. Mr. Attorney General, uh, congratulations on yesterday. Um, but as just noted, President Biden, at least at this moment, has a pretty deeply underwater his poll ratings in your state. Um, talk to us about how you want to navigate that going forward. Would you want President Biden to be there campaigning with you? I'm excited for the president to come in and win North Carolina. He, he has been laser focused on restarting the economy, and we've seen it with ma massive investments, whether it's EV battery manufacturers or EV manufacturers or uh, silicon chip manufacturers. So a lot of great stuff is happening, but we're applying for different jobs. He's applying to the voters to be rehired. I'm applying to the voters to be hired as governor. And so my obligation is to make my case on why I want to do this job, what I feel like I can deliver for the people of North Carolina, and, and why they should ultimately hire me. Hi, um, it's Jennifer Palmieri. It's good to see you. Uh, I know a little bit about uh, your state. I've uh, worked on some campaigns there, too. Uh, my understanding is, I mean, I have two questions. One is, how are North Carolinians feeling about the Republican, the supermajority of the Republican state legislature that passed a 12-week abortion ban, um, you know, among other things, overrode uh, Governor Cooper's veto of that? Um, and also, you know, so how, how are folks feeling that, uh, about that, you know, that Republican legislature and also, the state, my understanding is the state has become, since 2020, um, more college educated, more urban. You know, how, how have there been demographic changes uh, that are relevant to your race, too? Thank, thanks, Jennifer. Well, you hit on a really interesting theme in North Carolina politics is there's an inherent sense of balance in the electorate. They don't like it when one party has all three branches or they don't like to vote the same party on president and governor. You know, it's interesting, North Carolina, seven of the last eight elections for governor, the people have chosen a Democrat. In seven of the last eight elections for president, they chose a Republican. It's just this sense of balance. And what we have right now is a Republican General Assembly that is off the rails. They, they are so far to the right. They are beyond what the electorate wants. Uh, you all mentioned the 12 week restriction that they passed on abortion last summer, overriding the governor's veto. Uh, and they're not done. They are crystal clear. The playbook is right in front of us. They want to eliminate abortion in North Carolina with no exceptions, not for rape, not for incest, not for the life or health of the mother. That is the position of my opponent. And if he wins, he will go there and the legislature will go there because of course they have gerrymandered maps that keep them from being held accountable. Uh, if I'm the governor, I will veto any further restrictions on women's reproductive freedoms. Uh, so we've got a lot of hard work to do, but I, I think we can get it done. And there is a changing electorate here in North Carolina. And I think that that will only underscore people's upset and, and anger at the legislature for going too far to the right and, and their rejection of Mark Robinson's fringe extremism. Final question for you, Mr. Attorney General, and as you understand, the most important in the state of North Carolina, Saturday, 630, Carolina Duke at Cameron. Who you got? Oh, this is not fair. Who you got? <laughs> I know. I know. Hey, hey, look, I, I grew up going to Carmichael Auditorium and watching mm. Michael Jordan, uh, wow. James Worthy, Phil Ford. Uh, I, I'm cheering for the heels on Saturday. All right, go okay. Heels. I think that's yeah. probably the right answer. Yeah. Democratic yeah. nominee yeah. for North Carolina governor, the state's attorney general, Josh Stein. Congratulations on your win last night. We'll be watching you here in the general. Thanks for your time. Courage. Thanks very much.
Coming up on Morning Joe, could a tech billionaire help Donald Trump erase his financial disadvantage in the 2024 race? We'll have details about a reported meeting at Mar-a-Lago between Trump and, yes, Elon Musk. You're watching Morning Joe. We'll be right back. What you gonna do? What you gonna do? What you gonna do? The New York Times is reporting former President Trump met with Elon Musk on Sunday at Mar-a-Lago, along with a few wealthy Republican donors, according to three people briefed on the meeting. NBC News has not independently verified that report. Neither Trump nor Musk responded to the paper's request for comment. Musk has been at odds with Trump in the past and has never endorsed him. But as the Times points out, Musk's recent social media posts suggest he wants to see President Biden defeated in November, and Donald Trump desperately needs money for his campaign. Meanwhile, a bipartisan group of lawmakers has introduced a bill that would require ByteDance, the China-based parent company of TikTok, to sell off the popular video sharing app within six months or face a ban in the United States. Lawmakers have raised concern that data from the app could fall into the hands of the Chinese government. A TikTok spokesperson described the bill as a, quote, outright ban. For more on this, let's bring in CNBC's Dom Chu. So, Dom, is there a chance TikTok is banned in the United States? Uh, there's a pretty good one if this legislation goes through, Willie, to that point. This is, the, of course, the House Select Committee on China moving to introduce the Protecting Americans from Foreign Adversary Controlled Applications Act. It's a mouthful. But like you said, what the legislation would threaten to do is give the president, whoever that is, the authority to ban any apps that are controlled by U.S. designated adversaries. So the wildly popular TikTok app is being seen as the genesis of this bill since TikTok is owned by China's bite dance the bill would tell them to sell itself or in six months or face the ban now representative mike gallagher is a republican from wisconsin the chair of that china committee he said that quote this is my message to tiktok break up with the chinese communist party or lose access to your american users meanwhile Representative Raja Krishnamurti from Illinois, the top-ranking Democrat, said that the bill would protect Americans from, quote, digital surveillance and influence operations of the regimes that could weaponize their personal data against them. You mentioned the TikTok uh, response to this, so we'll see how this all plays out in Washington, D.C. Meanwhile, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, or CFPB, introduced a new rule yesterday that said it would cap late fees that banks charge customers at eight bucks per incident. It said that it reviewed data and found that that big banks that issue credit cards have been raising the cost of penalties since 2010, with those fees topping a whopping $14 billion in 2022. The regulator says that late fees on average were $32 per incident, which led to an average of $220 in fees per user per year, many of those incurred by lower credit score customers. Now, opponents of the new rules say that this will just lead banks to raising fees elsewhere in the system, which basically raises the cost for even more people. And today is a big day for economic and policy commentary with Federal Reserve Chairman Jay Powell set to kick off two days worth of uh, testimony to lawmakers in Washington, D.C. It's part of that mandated twice a year testimony on the state of the American economy from the Fed chair to lawmakers and what used to be called the Humphrey Hawkins testimony. He'll start with the House Financial Services Committee today, 10 a.m. Eastern Time. The prepared remarks we've seen will highlight that policymakers are still focused on inflation and that risks that higher prices pose to the economy still remain. Officials do not want to move to lower interest rates too quickly until it's clear that inflation is no longer a threat. That's what the message will be. Powell will address the Senate Banking Committee tomorrow. Now, just to put this in perspective, guys, markets in recent weeks have ratcheted down expectations for the number of expected rate cuts this year. So that testimony will be key to a lot of folks, Willie, on Main Street, Wall Street, and of course, K Street. All right, thank you, CNBC's Dom Chu. Greatly appreciate it, as always. Um, a couple of things, first of all, TikTok being banned. The chances of that are, hold on, let me get my calculator <laughs> out. Okay, zero, <laughs> that will never happen. On oh, the credit card issue though, it really is. And you know, John Avalon, I always love guys that are running, women that are running for Congress that are knocking on doors. He kept talking about affordability. Economy's going great in so many areas. There are three areas right now that Americans are concerned about, and John was talking about part of this, credit card rates, groceries, and gas. 
And that's where it, where it hits them the hardest. Yeah, and the Biden administration has been good on this kind of stuff. The airline fees, remember mm -hmm. that? This is a little, it might seem sort of granular, but it's the stuff that annoys the hell out of people. It yeah. costs them a lot of money, especially given the amount of credit card debt in this country. So uh, that's probably a good move, and you might hear about it tomorrow night in the State of the Union. The United States not the only country with a key election this year. In fact, half of the planet's population is expected to vote this year. The editor-in-chief of Semaphore, Ben Smith, joins our conversation as Semaphore launches its new global election hub, highlighting critical elections and candidates around the world. Ben, it's always great to see you. Yeah, thanks for So tell us me. about the idea behind this and where we should be looking around the world that perhaps we're not right now. Yeah, I mean, I think, we, you know, at Semaphore, our, our sort of thesis is that it's hard to understand these national stories without a global view. I mean, if you kind of look at what happened to Nikki Haley last night, you, you, you see echoes of that and prefigurations of that everywhere. Um, you know, Portugal, for instance, is voting this Sunday. And surprise, a far-right anti-immigration party surging in the polls. Um, and, and, you know, this year there are two kind of really big trends that we also see here, which is the rise of this right-wing populism that's defined by a very specific style, opposition to immigration, guys with a certain hairstyle <laughs> in many locations. Wow. Um, and, uh, you know, and then at the same time, a sort of authoritarian tendency in places, you know, in, obviously in Russia where there's essentially a fake election, in India where the government has, mm. you know, taken control of the media to a large degree, in Mexico where the, the, the government also is putting a lot of pressure on the media. And I think you, you sort of, you know, you can, you can look, it's, it's helpful to see that these aren't solely American trends and issues. So Ben, are you only paying attention to these disturbing trends? I mean, when I look at what's going on in India, what's going on in Portugal, what's going on in South Korea, what's happening in the U.S., are there any other, other more, shall we say, uh, exciting trends that are happening with regards to democracy around? I mean, broadly, no. Oh. Specifically, though, these are, you know, there are these very intense battles, like the one we're having here, happening all over the place. You see, actually, in Italy in particular, a real, you know, the far-right party that took power last year is now really fighting for its life in regional and local elections. In Germany, there are these, you know, very, very contested, high-stakes fights, like you have here, with far-right parties rising. And this question of who, who and what is the coalition on the other side starting to form. And is a, I think this, this is so important because I think we do, we said, oh, why is Joe Biden's approval rating so low? It's like, if you're a Democratic leader, your approval rating is low globally. What are you, are you seeing, is, is a, I know it's early, but does the picture emerge of why this is happening in, in, in these, like, what are the, what are the threads that you're pulling out of, the simil of similarities? I mean, there is just this sort of broad anger at democratically elected incumbents, um, you know, that I think to some degree doesn't always track how are things going domestically. Right. And, you know, in South Africa, where things are going badly domestically, you also have the ANC might lose power for the first time since, you know, wow. since democracy came into, into place. And so, I mean, I think you just have this, this very broad anger at incumbent parties all over the place. And, and, and it makes it so fascinating. Um, I'll, give you, I'll give you some good news. Um, Poland. Mm -hmm. Here you had the Law and Justice Party in power um, for, what, six, seven years? Uh, and it was, it was Orban's Hungary and the Law and Justice Party. And against all odds, Donald Tusk won, and he won pretty comfortably. And, I mean, Donald Tusk was as pro-EU as you can get. Mm -hmm. And so that win really signals... Uh, uh, a growing discomfort there. And I've got to also say, uh, I've been fascinated, um, Jen, by Maloney, who was in the White House recently. She, I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, she came from basically Mussolini's party, uh, right. Mussolini's background. People were expecting her to just torch the EU, and she's been a great friend of the EU. She's been a great friend of... Uh, she's been a great friend of Ukraine. Uh, she has been a, 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 a good friend of the West. Now, is she, is she a liberal uh, Democrat? No. But, but I, I, I wonder if in Europe there's not this sort of pull and understanding, which they got in Poland. If you want your country to thrive, it helps to not be fighting the EU like Orban. I was really worried when she won because, you know, I remember, mm -hmm. I remember in, uh, was it, was the Brexit vote in 2015? You know, thinking, whoa, what's going on over there? Right. And so when she won, you were looking at, is that, is that a precursor, as opposed to Macron winning in 2022, mm -hmm. is that a precursor to a, to an authoritarian uh, winning here? And it is interesting she has, with 
with Ukraine, with the EU growing sort of back mm -hmm. and strength, she has she has uh, moderated. She really has, and and as far as approval ratings go, Alex is really telling me to go quickly. <laughs> that he's, always uh, works. He's speeding <laughs> up <laughs> quickly. There were twelve right, quicklies Alex. in thirty seconds. <laughs> Does she know that has the opposite effect? All right, let's I'm going to. I mean, seriously, I'm going I'm to go as quickly as I can. Financial Times had an extraordinary. Just getting back to the point about low approval ratings, an extraordinary story about, especially in Western democracy, approval ratings really low. Macron's approval ratings 35 percent before the last election. Everybody said no way could win. What did I, what did Morning Show oh, book, bookies uh, put it at? The over under was 57.5. That's what he won by, 57.5. You can't look at approval ratings in the West anymore and attach that to election results. It just, as this Financial Times article showed, and especially Macron, just doesn't apply. And when you look at that Financial Times list, all of a sudden you go, oh, President Biden's not so, so bad relative to other leaders yeah. in the rest of the world. Approval. Ben, I want to get you on this election here quickly because you understand the media so well. You've covered it so well over the years. You've created media companies, worked inside the media. Just about how... We're handling this matchup again between Joe Biden and Donald Trump and differently than, say, 2016, when Donald Trump was a new idea and maybe he was going to come to Washington and shake things up. Now we know so much more about the way he would govern because he's telling us out loud. How has the coverage been and how should it go going forward? Well, I think it's been very, very different because in 2016, the media maybe naively, maybe cynically saw Donald Trump as a vehicle for ratings and, you know, mm. aired his speeches and, and got clicks, you know, from stories about Donald Trump. Donald Trump was all over Facebook. And the challenge the media faces now is that even as this, I think, feels to lots of people here like an incredibly high stakes election with huge differences in how the two would govern, I think a lot of people watching it are freaked out, but in a way that makes them, you know, tune out. And I think you're, you're, we're sort of struggling to break through with audiences who really don't want to read or sort of engage with this election. And I think that may change again as the, as the summer wears on, but that's where it is now. Yeah. yeah, I think by October, the world will be tuned in. They may not want to hear it now, but as the stakes become clear. Exactly. And before we go, can I just say thank you to Alex Corson for his patience staying a day. Yes. Alex is the Tough absolute job. best in the business. Worst job in the business. <laughs> and we thank you, Alex. We love you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alex. And thank you, Ben. Always thank great you. to see you. Moments from now, Nikki Haley will announce the end of her presidential campaign as the general election between President Biden and former President Donald Trump essentially begins today. Anna Cabrera, Jose diaz Blart, and Andrea Mitchell pick up the coverage in just two minutes. It is 10 o'clock Eastern, and we are following breaking news this morning with Nikki Haley expected to announce in just moments that she is suspending her presidential campaign. Thanks for being here. I'm Ana Cabrera with special coverage alongside my colleagues, Jose diaz Ballard and Andrea Mitchell. Any moment now, Nikki Haley is expected to speak from South Carolina. There you see the podium with the flags all set up. She's going to announce her exit from the presidential race, according to two sources familiar. And those remarks coming after Haley's disappointing Super Tuesday showing, netting her just one victory, the state of Vermont. Let's get right to NBC's Von Hilliard in West Palm Beach, Florida, and NBC's Steve Kornacki's with us from the big board. Also joining us, Simone Sanders Townsend, co-host of The Weekend on MSNBC, Tara Setmare, former GOP communications director, and Mark Murray, NBC News senior political editor. Thank you all for joining us. So Vaughn, Haley kicked off her campaign 385 days ago. What are you anticipating as we wait for her remarks to begin? Right. More than a year ago, Nikki Haley has been running this campaign against Donald Trump. Donald Trump, much to his chagrin, had noted multiple times that she had once promised that she would never challenge him. But like others, including his own former vice president, Mike Pence, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, South Carolina Senator Tim Scott and others, they all jumped into the race thinking that they could knock off the former president. Nikki Haley, the last one standing. And with the results that came in last night, in which she only pulled off a victory in the state of Utah, losing in 15 other states. This was a clear message sent by the Republican electorate, that the Republican electorate in the United States of America wants Donald Trump to be their nominee, despite four criminal indictments, despite having been found to have sexually abused E. Jean Carroll, despite having been found to have repeatedly engaged through his uh, the Trump organization. 
and financial fraud. They wanted Donald Trump to be their nominee. And Nikki Haley, we anticipate her making these remarks any moment now. And uh, notably, per Ali Vitali, our colleague who is in the room right now, uh, she does not intend to endorse Donald Trump, suggesting that there is a great share of the Republican electorate, the independent electorate, that wants uh, a, a different message coming out of this Republican nominee. The question here is, would that mean potentially supporting Joe Biden down the road? And does Donald Trump have any interest in expanding his appeal, or does he believe that he is running a campaign that can outright beat Joe Biden as it exists in its capacity right now, guys? And Vaughn, we're expecting in about a minute, at least if the two-minute warning that we got about a minute ago holds, that she will be coming into the room. We understand that she will be without her, her family will be in the room, but she will be alone at the podium. At least that was the game plan going in. And Vaughn, it's really, you know, really interesting that we don't expect an endorsement. She's not going to fold in. And we certainly got a, a key indication of that with Kristen Welker on Meet the Press on Sunday when she said that she took that Republican pledge, the RNC pledge, because that was the, the ticket to get on the debate stage. And there were a lot of other candidates then, of course. But uh, in any case, we expect her not to endorse. And here she is coming into the podium, Nikki Haley. Just over a year ago, I launched my campaign for president. When I began, I said the campaign was grounded in my love for our country. Just last week, my mother, a first-generation immigrant, got to vote for her daughter for president. Only in America. I am filled with the gratitude for the outpouring of support we've received from all across our great country. But the time has now come to suspend my campaign. I said I wanted Americans to have their voices heard. I have done that. I have no regrets. And although I will no longer be a candidate, I will not stop using my voice for the things I believe in. Our national debt will eventually crush our economy. A smaller federal government is not only necessary for our freedom, it is necessary for our survival. The road to socialism is the road to ruin for America. Our Congress is dysfunctional and only getting worse. It is filled with followers, not leaders. Term limits for Washington politicians are needed now more than ever. Our world is on fire because of America's retreat. Standing by our allies in Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan is a moral imperative. But it's also more than that. If we retreat further, there will be more war, not less. As important, while we stand strong for the cause of freedom, we must bind together as Americans. We must turn away from the darkness of hatred and division. I will continue to promote all those values, as is the right of every American. I sought the honor of being your president. But in our great country, being a private citizen is privilege enough in itself. And that's a privilege I very much look forward to enjoying. In all likelihood, Donald Trump will be the Republican nominee when our party convention meets in July. I congratulate him and wish him well. I wish anyone well who would be America's president. Our country is too precious to let our differences divide us. I have always been a conservative Republican and always supported the Republican nominee. But on this question, as she did on so many others, Margaret Thatcher provided some good advice when she said, quote, never just follow the crowd, always make up your own mind. It is now up to Donald Trump to earn the votes of those in our party and beyond it who did not support him. And I hope he does that. At its best, politics is about bringing people into your cause, not turning them away. And our conservative cause badly needs more people. This is now his time for choosing. I end my campaign with the same words I began it from the book of Joshua. I direct them to all Americans, but especially 
to so many of the women and girls out there who put their faith in our campaign. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for God will be with you wherever you go. In this campaign, I have seen our country's greatness from the bottom of my heart. Thank you, America. God bless you. You've been listening to Nikki Haley suspending her presidential campaign today. Our whole panel is still with us, including Jennifer Palmieri, who just joined. But let me start with you, Vaughn, because you spent a lot of time on the campaign trail throughout the primaries so far. And so what stood out to you when we listened to Nikki Haley's brief remarks announcing her exit right. and urging Donald Trump to earn the support of her voters? Right, Anna. What stood out to me was the specific line from Nikki Haley. It's now up to Donald Trump to earn the votes of those in our party who did not support him, including myself. It's about bringing people into your cause. This is now his time for choosing. Having been there eight years ago on the day that Ted Cruz dropped out of his presidential campaign in Indiana to Donald Trump, he gave similar remarks. He didn't endorse Donald Trump that day and said it took him several months. And yet what we watched over the course of those months in 2016, and we've even seen take place over the last months here in 2024, is that Republicans time and again have gone back to Donald Trump regardless of his, uh, of his efforts. You know, Donald Trump, over just the last 36 hours, referred to her as bird brain again. This is a, a, a man who uh, continually mocked her birth name, uh, had openly promoted the question of whether she could even run for president because her parents are immigrants. That is the man who she is urging to bring her back into the fold, despite her having suggested repeatedly from the campaign trail that he was not fit to be president of the United States. And so I think the question here is whether Donald Trump feels compelled to actually shift the way that he's running his presidential campaign. And so far, his advisors say no. And the last thing I want to point out is we are talking about those independent voters or even those conservatives who are reticent to Donald Trump. And those are the voters that decided the elections in Georgia, in Arizona, Michigan, in Wisconsin, not only in 2020, but also in 2022. And they gave Democrats the wins in those pivotal races. When when you look at 2016 to 2020, guys, in the movement of independence from, or I should say, away from Donald Trump from 2016 to 2020, in Arizona, it was 12, 12 percentage points, Georgia, 20, Michigan, 22, Nevada, 19, Pennsylvania, 15, Wisconsin, 25. This is the part of the electorate that Nikki Haley largely speaks to. And the question is, could the likes of her own words and where she throws her support in the months ahead, could the support of Liz Cheney, those types of conservatives reticent to Donald Trump, could they have a major impact on the trajectory of this presidential race in the months ahead? Nikki Haley, in those short remarks, made it clear that she intends to be a part of that very conversation. And Steve Kornacki, Haley's exit now makes Donald Trump the presumptive Republican nominee. The delegate math, of course, was never in her favor. I was really struck by the fact that she said that she was going to, you know, not follow the crowd, make up her own mind. But she also used lines against socialism, against big government that she's used against Joe Biden and the Democrats. So she was clearly not going in that direction. And she put it squarely on Donald Trump. Now it's up to you. So she, to me, is signaling that depending on what he does next, that there is maybe an opening there for her to join in to unite the party. But just moments before she announced, he was on Truth Social saying Nikki Haley got trounced last night, all caps his. So he was smashing her on Truth Social just moments before she dropped out. Yeah, and I, I think we have to introduce one question here just in, into this conversation of, you know, Haley's out. She's received, as we've shown, a number of votes across these different primaries. Her high watermark will be winning narrowly in Vermont. She got 43 percent in New Hampshire, 40 percent in her home state of South Carolina. But I think when you look at the, to the totality, excuse me, of her vote uh, across all of these states, a couple questions come to mind. And, and, and the biggest one is how many of the voters who supported Nikki Haley in Republican primaries are actually already Joe Biden supporters. 
They're not there for Donald Trump to win over. They were never going to be there for Donald Trump to win over. Let me show you an example of what I'm talking about. Let's call up Virginia last night. Now, Trump wins Virginia by 28 points. Virginia, on paper, was one of the most demographically friendly to Nikki Haley states that was voting yesterday on Super Tuesday. In fact, had she been performing with the group she's done best with at those same levels in Virginia, as we saw in New Hampshire and South Carolina, this state would have been very competitive statewide last night. Instead, she's, she's losing it by 28 points. But Virginia is an open primary. Everyone could participate in it, if, in it if they wanted to. And this was true in many, many states. It was true in South Carolina. It was true in Michigan. Independence, a huge chunk of the New Hampshire electorate could participate there. And I, I think there's a lot of evidence coming out of all of these primaries that a, a very significant factor in the Republican electorate in the vote was people who voted for Biden in 2020 <coughs> who will never vote for Trump, who are, they are motivated by their opposition to Donald Trump, but the rules allowed them to participate in these Republican primaries, and they obviously sided with Nikki Haley because they want to vote against Donald Trump. And some of the evidence for that is that when you ask in the exit poll, what is your, uh, do you approve or disapprove of Joe Biden's job as president? In a Republican primary electorate in Virginia, one out of five voters said, yes, they approve of Biden's job performance as president. Now, in our own NBC poll of Republican voters, when we ask for Joe Biden's approval rating, it clocks in at 3%. So when you see a Republican primary electorate that is seven times more favorable to Joe Biden and the job he's doing as president than we're getting when we poll Republicans, uh, that should set your alarm bells off in terms of, I think there was a lot of crossover voting here and elsewhere from folks who just want to vote against Donald Trump and will in November. Because when we look at the general election polling, we don't see a lot of slack for Donald Trump with Republicans. We see some slack for Joe Biden in his base, but not for Donald Trump among Republicans. So I actually think there's a counterintuitive lesson that's emerged from these primaries, and that is these crossover voters that I'm describing, they tend to be suburbanites. They tend to be college educated. Again, this is the demographic Trump we've seen struggle with in general elections. And they have been turning out in massive numbers in special elections. It's why Democrats have performed so well in special elections, uh, most recently on Long Island. And for Democrats, I think it means that that segment of their base, the suburban college educated segment of the Democratic base, is absolutely on fire for turnout. And Democrats don't have to worry about that in November. That's the positive that Democrats can actually take from these Republican primaries. But whether there's a huge, huge chunk of voters here who are actually open to Donald Trump that you're seeing in these primaries not with him right now, I, I think we have to ask some critical questions about that. Steve Kornacki, thank you so very much. Really appreciate it. I want to bring in Ali Vitali, who was in the room for Haley's speech in South Carolina. Ali, good morning. What was the mood like there? A somber mood here, Jose, as roughly 100 campaign staffers came in the same building as their headquarters to the first floor of this building where we stood all night last night waiting to see if we would see the candidate. That silence ultimately led us to this morning where the campaign said they would be suspending their bid for president. And then, of course, as soon as Nikki Haley walked in the room, she said it immediately. She's suspending her race. But what she didn't say is notable here. The fact that she is not endorsing the former president, it struck me that she said she is a lifelong conservative Republican. She has always voted for her party's nominee, but that this is going to be a time for choosing, invoking someone who I have heard her quote throughout this campaign, the Iron Lady herself, Margaret Thatcher, someone who Haley mentioned in her book that she wrote before the campaign actually began, someone who Haley has tried to model herself after with that kind of steel backbone style of leadership that Thatcher was known for. The fact that she invokes her on a day like today I think is fitting for a candidate who's leaving this race, but clearly vowing that she could be someone who comes back into the fold and issuing a challenge to the former president and her former boss, saying that he now has to earn back the voters that she took from him over the course of this Republican primary. I think that Steve makes a good point when he points out that Haley's coalition was not just Republican traditional voters who would come out in a primary, that it also consisted of independents. And I asked her that question back in New Hampshire. I said, how do you win a Republican nomination when you're not necessarily winning Republican base voters? And she said that, in fact, that's the wrong way to look at it and that instead the party should be trying to make a bigger tent for themselves. That's something that Vaughn knows Trump has been sort of loath to do at one point saying that anyone who gives money to 
to or backs Haley would be barred permanently. And I think that it's it's striking that in the Biden campaign's response to Haley's dropout just in the last few minutes, they say Donald Trump made it clear he doesn't want Nikki Haley's supporters. I want to be clear, the Biden campaign says there is a place for them in my campaign. And I can tell you in traveling this country over the last year, but certainly over the course of the last few months, I meet these voters all the time who tell me themselves in their words, they are lifelong Republicans, and they don't know if they can see themselves getting behind the Republican nominee in November if it's Donald Trump. Some of those voters say they might even vote for Joe Biden or else they'll stay home. And, you know, Simone, just thinking about the difference between today and yesterday, right? She was talking over and over again about the fact that very few of the states had voted, had spoken. Well, 16 states spoke yesterday, and what they said was, we want Donald Trump. Trump. What does this say about the Republican Party, the Republican voters right now? Is this a possibility for the bigger tent, as uh, Haley was uh, talking about, or is that tent shut? I am sorry to laugh, and I was sitting here trying to pull up all of the things that Nikki Haley has said about Donald Trump, the the way that he disparaged veterans, and after that, specifically Nikki Haley's husband, and then Nikki Haley said, someone like that is not fit to be president, the way that he speaks about women. And so I, I think that a number of people had been looking for Nikki Haley since she started to throw, you know, make sharper contrasts against Donald Trump to really pick up the mantle of that ball that folks keep trying to toss to her. And she had an opportunity to do that today, but instead, she made the point that she wanted to make sure that all of Americans' voices were heard, and this price, many voices were heard, and she felt that that had been done. And now, um, you know, the ball is essentially in Donald Trump's court, and she said that it is up to him to earn the votes of her supporter, supporters, herself included. I don't know if I could support um, someone who disparaged the person that I love in the way in which Donald Trump disparaged Nikki Haley and her husband. And so it's oftentimes within the Republican Party apparatus when it comes to these primary contests for president, where Donald Trump is concerned, the dignity of the other candidates in the race who have gone to challenge him are directly attacked and it comes into question because it, uh, campaigns are about contrast. You say things on a debate stage and in campaigns because you you want to win, but there are lines, and Donald Trump has repeatedly crossed them. So anyone who thinks that, you know, given, and I mean, Donald Trump has already posted on his social media site saying Nikki Haley was trounced mm -hmm. um, in all caps. He said much of her money came from radical left Democrats. Not true. Uh, he ended it talking about Joe Biden is the enemy. Again, something insane, I think, to say. And then said, but he would further like to invite all the Haley supporters to join the greatest movement. Well, think about Ted Cruz, Lindsey Graham. I mean, right. all those things that you were just talking about, Marco Rubio, mm -hmm. they all came home to Trump eventually, Tara. Well, that's partially why we're here now, because none of them back in 2016 or 2020 had the backbone to stand up to him and say no. As Bill Buckley used to say, conservatives' role was to st yell stop athwart history when no one else would. Well, no one else in the party has done that, really, except for a handful, and they've been run out of the party, like Liz Cheney and Chris Christie and others, um, Adam Kinzinger. Uh, the thing about this is that Donald Trump can't have it both ways, and neither can Nikki Haley. She needs to be consistent. The only time she started to really punch back is when he went after her husband, who was serving our country honorably, unlike Donald Trump, who was a draft dodger. So at that point, now it became personal for her. Well, that's wonderful, but it's been personal for a lot of Americans for years who have been on the receiving end of Donald Trump's insults and his indignities. So, you know, that's great that she's decided to do that now, but more importantly, she represents a large swath of the Republican Party that is homeless now. They don't know what to do. And we've seen consistently that they are, are voting at 20 to 35 percent against Donald Trump. Where do those people go? Carl Rove was on Fox News last night saying, Thing. The Trump campaign really has a five alarm fire here looking at how many of these Republicans are not going to vote for him. How are they going to unify? Because Donald Trump is consistently insulting them, telling them we don't need them. Just last week he was at a rally and said, we don't want you moderate Republicans. We're, we're kicking out the Romneys of the party. That is contracting. That is not expanding the tent, to Jose's point. And the, to win elections, you need to have 50 plus one. So this is, in, I, I mean, I think Nikki Haley is trying to buy, buy some time. 
because she wants to still remain relevant, right? Power and relevance is a hell of a drug, and she has that for right now. But at some point, what is she going to do? Is she going to go the same way, with the same level of indignity as Ted Cruz and Mitch McConnell and all the rest of them who fell in line for Donald Trump and sell the country out when she's in a position to say, the only way that we want to save democracy and make sure that we actually have real policy decisions is to make sure that Joe Biden wins the presidency this time around, and then we can argue about it later, because at least he's not a threat to our democracy. Jennifer, she means it or she doesn't. Sorry. Jennifer, it seems as though just the national discourse, politics uh, as a game, uh, has been so... Um, cheapened and 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 the talk has gotten so ugly and i think that 2015 was really a watershed a watershed moment for the ugliness of how people speak about each other in politics and how that is carried out really through our national discourse i'm just wondering with that being the reality and i would like to add that let's not forget that uh, the former president has been saying on the on the campaign trail that immigrants are poisoning the blood of this country and that they are coming from mental institutions and that in other words all of this I don't know what it is, semantics, but it has such a, a deep, heavy, vitriolic mm -hmm. effect on our nation. Is this pretty much it? I mean. The voters, uh, the Republican voters, spoke very loudly uh, until, you know, last night that they want Donald Trump. I mean, he did, he did sort of release, I mean, I think, you know, leadership matters and people respond to leadership. And when you release that kind of ugliness into the world, it will find traction and, and it has really taken hold in the country. But what I find inspiring and reassuring is people continue to turn out and vote in huge, huge numbers and that Democrats continue to win in this case, being both big D's and little D's and that people are not so... You know, you can be exhausted by the news and you can be troubled by it, but people are still turning out to say, I'm rejecting that. And so I find that um, it, it, you know, and, and the other thing about this in terms of contrast, now that we know, like for real, it's definitely going to be Biden and Trump. Uh, Biden, as you know, I know I talked to a lot of uh, pollsters that um, do focus groups around him. His decency as a person really holds him up. You know, his approval rating is low. Approval ratings are low everywhere. And if you're a Democratic leader in a country anywhere, your approval rating's low. Joe Biden's approval rating is actually higher relative to other world leaders. Um, the right track, wrong track, is uh, that also is off. For like the last 20 years, people have just been more pessimistic about the future. Uh, these sort of metrics um, are, are not as relevant as they used to be in determining who's actually going to win. But Joe Biden, as a decent father, as as, you know, a good family man, as somebody who really cares about the country, that does come through. That is a good counterbalance, you know, and, and it is discouraging to hear uh, all of what Trump says and his followers that uh, double down on that. Um, but Biden does get more votes, <laughs> you know? Like, we shouldn't just, I, I don't lose sight of that, that in the end, uh, there does seem to be more people that are wanting to be on the side of decency. That is why the president going out there campaigning, getting in front of voters and retail politics is going to be very important for his campaign. He is a great retail politician. I would argue so is Vice President Harris. And when people get to see the candidates up close and they see the decency that Jen is talking about, they can, they can, and the candidate becomes not just this, you know, far away figure that they cannot imagine, but a real person sitting in front of them that they can talk to and ask questions to, it can change the minds of people across the country. But also the wish casting that it wouldn't be Biden and Trump is now over. We, we've been saying this for months of the Lincoln Project, that it's going to be Biden and Trump and everybody needs to stop all of this fantasy, fantasizing about it being somebody else. Now the reality is cemented. It will be Biden and Trump. And so hopefully the Biden campaign can start pushing the messaging. I saw Jamie Harrison on air last night using terminology, which I think that they've probably focused group, which was good. Joe Biden did that. He went down a list of accomplishments because President Biden's actually had a very successful presidency. But perception is reality in politics. Politics, and there's been a, a deficit here in, in pushing the messaging of all of the positive things that Biden has done. So if they start doing this now and it starts the repeating it over and over again, people start realizing that, yes, we already know Joe Biden is old. Thank you. Can we talk about other things more substantive, like what he's accomplished and what he plans to do for the country versus what Donald Trump is saying, dictator on day one, this Project 2025 that wants to, you know, rechange our entire federal bureaucracy, retribution against enemies. There is a clear contrast 
contrast that the American people need to need to make a decision on. And now's the time to start setting that narrative. Ladies, stand back with us. Andrea, you have news on an endorsement for Trump. A big one indeed. Uh, Mitch McConnell, the Republican leader, endorsing Donald Trump, the presumptive nominee. Mark Murray here with me. Mitch McConnell, who just days ago last week, I guess, said that he is going to step down as leader at the end of this year, uh, but stay in the Senate, and recognizing that it is now Donald Trump's Republican Party. Um, behind the scenes, he, he's also mourning the death of his sister-in-law. It's been a very difficult time medically for him as well. But the reality is more political than medical. He would press on. That's the Mitch McConnell that we've covered for decades, you and I. Uh, how important is it for Donald Trump, that Mitch McConnell, who had been really the holdout among the Republicans in the Senate, is now basically throwing in the tower. Yeah, Andrew, it's really instructive on how the party starts to kind of come together and even parts that aren't necessarily fans of, of former President Donald Trump, that with eight months to go, that as time goes on and the sites become, this is going to be Joe Biden versus Donald Trump, how Republicans go back to their corners and Democrats go back into theirs. And when it comes to Mitch McConnell, do not do note that it's just not, he he's not the only recent endorsement coming from the Senate side who's been kind of critical of Donald Trump. We saw John Thune do the exact same thing. And so I do think that that is a suggestion eventually about how Nikki Haley comes, not predicting, because obviously the remarks we heard from t uh, tonight, uh, this morning, the ball is in his court. That She ended up having some potentially critical comments of his. Well, but as time goes on, you can potentially see her doing the same thing. And John Barrasso was already in the Trump camp. He's going to be running now for whip, the number two spot. Uh, so I don't know what you know what you think. It's too early to tell, maybe. But would this quiet the rebellion that we've already seen in the Rick Scott part of the Republican Party? Will Donald Trump go along with this, or will he be on the revenge mode and not accept this endorsement and want his own? trusted player in there. Andrea, Donald Trump is always unpredictable. And so it's hard to note what he's going to say on his true social account, like we saw Nikki Haley this uh, this morning. It's hard to actually anticipate how he'll end up receiving this. But I think one little rule of thumb about Donald Trump is that when people actually come to him and say, hey, I'm now behind you, Donald Trump usually embraces them. It is when they criticize him that when he punches back. And so I do think that as people start coming back into the fold, that you'll end up seeing the Donald Trump we saw from last night, the more magnanimous side, as opposed to the side who always likes to punch back. And a lot of that is determined on, hey, are you in his corner or are you against him? And, and now the question is, what was what is Nikki Haley going to do? And you've got some people there who know her very well. Yeah, everyone stay close because I want to bring in a couple of people who know Nikki Haley and South Carolina politics really well. Today's show co-host and South Carolina native Craig Melvin and former South Carolina governor Mark Sanford. Guys, thanks for jumping on with us here. Craig, you've interviewed Nikki Haley multiple times, sure, including sure. just recently, just a few weeks ago. So as you hear her message today, as yeah. she bows out of the presidential race, what goes through your mind? That was hard for her. Really hard for her. I've, I've known uh, the former ambassador and governor for 20 years since she st served in the state legislature there in South Carolina. Uh, until now, Nikki Haley had never lost a race, uh, to be fair, which is, which is quite the feat for a woman in South Carolina politics. But the reality was, when I talked to her a few weeks ago down in Charleston, she had uh, all but acknowledged it was going to be a steep climb. There was a hope that last night she would have performed a little bit better uh, in Virginia. But if you look at how well she did with suburban women, if you look at how well she did with independent voters this primary, um, there are still a lot of Republican voters who don't like the idea of Donald Trump being the nominee. And she, she knew that. That's what prompted her to get in the race. And I think ultimately that's what she thought uh, would help her. What's going to be very interesting is the role that she plays over the next few months leading up uh, until the election in November. Or does she play a role at all? I mean, is, is this going to be a situation where, as some have predicted this morning, at some point she falls in line? Or does she become uh, a never-Trumper? And I, I think it is telling that she didn't uh, endorse this morning. If you listen, you pointed this out, if you listen to the language that she used this morning, she, she basically said, at some point, perhaps I'll consider endorsing if Donald Trump does this. Mm -hmm. And I think, I, I think that's very interesting. Here's what's not going to happen. Uh, if Donald Trump is reelected, she's not going to serve in the administration. She's not going to help his president. She made that abundantly clear. 
And I think if you also look at the language that she started to use, especially over the last month or two, she was uh, more critical of Donald Trump than at any point she had been in her political career. And some have suggested that perhaps if she had been that aggressive with some of the language six months ago, yeah. maybe we're not having this conversation right now. You know, and I want to point back to something that she told you just a couple of weeks ago when you spoke with her. This is what she said about Trump back then. Take a listen. The problem now is he is not the same person he was in 2016. He is unhinged. He is more diminished than he than he was. Unhinged yeah. and more diminished. I right? mean, she all but called the former president a basket case, and and that's that's not what you you would you would have never heard Nikki Haley say that three months ago. And I think the hope was politically uh, that that kind of language, that kind of rhetoric, ratcheting it up a bit, might help her. And I think she found the opposite to be true uh, because the, the the reality is, and we've talked about the polling that shows this. Uh, yes, there are a slew of Americans that have legitimate concerns about President Biden's age. Um, I mean, Donald Trump isn't that much younger, but for whatever reason, a, a, a slew of Americans have, have just accepted that. It's baked in. And I thought, I think that she thought she could move the needle there, and she was, she was never able to do it. It's, but, but Jose, it, it was, for me at least, striking to hear her be so openly critical yeah. when she had been for years um, very careful about what she said uh, about the former president. But if you recall, even before she became ambassador, um, she was somewhat critical. I mean, but it's... it's and even as, as ambassador, when she served within the Trump administration, she was somebody who didn't always... Right. Fall right in line. She pointed that out, and in fact, that was one of the central theses um, of, of her book as well. Um, but it's, I, I, it's, it's fascinating. It really is on on, yeah. on so many levels. And now we are we are all bracing for what is going to be the longest presidential in general election time. in American history. In American history, we've never had a general election that's that's this long. And so but it begins. Be a Craig. Long, strange general election campaign. Craig Mellon, it's good to see you, buddy. Good to see, yeah. good to see Mark Sanford, by the way, as well. <laughs> Governor, <laughs> haven't, <laughs> in, haven't seen you in, in ages. How you doing? You look good. All the way around. It's good to hear your voice, Craig. Long time. <laughs> <laughs> Craig, we know you got a job. Yeah. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much for, for joining in. us. Thank you. Good to Thanks for you. having me. Andrea. And Governor Mark Sanford, let's pick it up there. So what did this race reveal about Nikki Haley's brand of Republican politics? Where does, you know, where does she fit into the Republican Party? Where do you fit into the Republican Party? And also wanted to just flag that Joe Biden on, uh, on Twitter, on X, saying, you don't have to agree with me on everything to know that MAGA extremism is a threat to this country. And what he's done is retweet you know, a, a copy link to a, a Donald Trump tweet where he went after Nikki Birdbrain Haley. So he is already reaching out to the Haley voters. Uh, in a very strange way. Um, so I, well, I'd say a couple of different things. You know, I'd say I, I take humble exception with with Craig in that I, I would argue, you know, her comment that, you know, uh, Trump has suddenly become unhinged uh is not accurate i mean I, I think he's been the same guy throughout um uh and and you know the four of us who spoke out early against trump were all gone on the republican side so corker and flake in the senate and me and amash in the house gone it's extinction so i you know i think that she's always played within the, the crayon lines if you want to call it that with regard to political relevancy. And so, you know, when back in one of the early debates, uh, you, you, would you, you know, support Trump if he's convicted, not, not indicted, but convicted, hers was one of the hands went, that went up because I think she knew at that time, and I think she's consistently done that with the exception of maybe the last month or so, that I can't go too hard against uh, the base, uh, can't, can't go too hard against him. And, and so, while she has stepped away from that, I would argue that she'll still play within the crayon lines and will come back to fold and that she'll end up endorsing Trump because to not do so risks the political extinction that me and Ken Singer and go down the list have seen. And I don't think she wants to play that game given the voice she wants to have within the Republican Party. So you think she'll endorse Trump even though just days ago on Meet the Press, she said she's no longer committed to endorsing Trump if he became the nominee. And here we are uh, now, he is the presumptive nominee. Well, you think she may come around to endorsing him for her own political future. My question is, 
What kind of influence does she even have? What would an endorsement actually mean when it comes to giving Trump more supporters? I, I don't think it means a lot. Um, I, you know, I, I think it's a kiss to the ring and it, it keeps you relevant for possible future runs. I think what's particularly interesting is the way that the Republican Party is in flux. I, 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 I think that if you look at the suburban voters last night, increasingly well-educated and, and of, of more means is shifting to the Democratic side. And you can see it with some of the, the, the black votes. I mean, almost a quarter in some cases, some of the Hispanic votes, rising numbers there, so that the Republican Party, oddly, is becoming the party of folks of lesser means, and the Democratic Party, in some cases, particularly the suburbs, is becoming of greater means. I think a lot of the Haley supporters were Democratic votes who just can't stand Trump, and there was no other place to go. It wasn't a particularly com it wasn't a competitive race on the Democratic side, and it was a protest vote. So I don't know that it means a lot other than a chance to stay in the arena, which I think would be important to the Haley campaign going forward. And just thinking about that, that tactic of not taking Trump on directly in these primaries, you can see that that was what DeSantis followed, Scott followed, so many other people followed, and they are out of it. Nikki Haley now being out of it. Do you think that she does have a future governor in a post? Uh, I, I guess we're still in the Trump era so i mean does she have a future in the trump republican era no uh i i think in the trump era it, 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 it's a one-person rocket ship and he's it um and everybody else is sort of uh, rocket fuel or spent rocket fuel uh i do think though uh age matters and you know trump isn't going to live forever she's young in her early 50s and I, I think we're going to have a huge debate within the Republican Party as to where we go next after Trump is gone. Are we going to continue this sort of MAGA movement, or are we going to come back to some of the things that the Republican Party and the conservative movement once stood for? That's going to be a giant debate, but it's not taking place at this time, as we have, I, I would argue, a cult of personality that's locked in around Trump. I mean, the operative question in my last race was, are you for or against Trump, period? Not issues, not themes, not ideas, not conservative things that I talked to these folks with for 20 years. It was, are you for or against Trump? And that's still the question, unfortunately. Former South Carolina Governor Mark Sanford, thank you so much for taking the time and offering your perspective. Again, the breaking news this morning, Nikki Haley now withdrawing from the Republican primary race, making Donald Trump the presumptive GOP nominee. Up next, after a quick break, we're going to take a look at the view from inside Trump world on Haley's exit. Is there a chance they work together ahead of November? You're watching special coverage on MSNBC. And we are back with special coverage of the breaking news this morning. Nikki Haley dropping out of the 2024 presidential race, leaving Donald Trump the last man standing in the race and now the presumptive Republican nominee and picking up an endorsement from one of his biggest Republican critics, Republican Senate leader Mitch McConnell, minority leader Mitch McConnell. NBC's Vaughn Hilliard is covering the Trump campaign for us from Florida. Also with us, New York Times Chief White House Correspondent Peter Baker, who wrote the book The Divider, Trump in the White House. So, Vaughn, what are we hearing from Trump world this morning? How about this from Trump world? Let it be Trump himself. Literally, as Nikki Haley was taking the stage in South Carolina, Donald Trump here at his Mar-a-Lago estate posting on his social media account, quote, Nikki Haley got all caps, trounced last night in record-setting fashion, despite the fact that Democrats, for reasons unknown, are allowed to vote in Vermont and various other Republican primaries. Donald Trump bemoaning the fact that she even won one of the 16 states that voted last night. But for Donald Trump, I think that this is important context because you heard her say up on that stage that it's up to Donald Trump to earn the support of not only her but others in the Republican Party and independents as well who are currently reticent to him as the Republican nominee. And when you're looking at the likes of where this Republican Party lies, look, Mitch McConnell, you know, Donald Trump on the campaign stage, when talking about Mitch McConnell just less than two years ago, referred to him as, quote, old broken down crow. Mitch 
McConnell. He said that he had, wish a, he had run a primary campaign to oust Mitch McConnell from office at one point. He, his son, Don Jr., in a stage in Florida just this fall, referred to him as, quote, Glitch McConnell. And you see Mitch McConnell here today throwing his support behind Donald Trump. But also the likes of Nebraska Republican Congressman Don Bacon, who was the first Republican U.S. House member to come out ahead of Donald Trump's 2024 announcement by saying he wouldn't support him in 2024. And just this morning, he's doing exactly that. And so the question here is, what is the path forward for a Nikki Haley? And I just want to put this out there, that No Labels, that organization that has been qualifying for ballots around the country, is still looking for a bipartisan unity ticket to run as a third party slate. And Nikki Haley, to our Ali Vitali, was clear in saying that she doesn't have interest in running with a Democrat. At the same time, No Label says that they are looking for a ticket by April 15th. That is a month from now. And you heard Nikki Haley say that it's up to Donald Trump to win her over. So theoretically, she's got several weeks to make the determination of whether it may be worth continuing her own presidential bid in a third party capacity, because that opportunity would be available to her if she so chose to take it up. And Peter, we know how important loyalty is to Donald Trump. Uh, you remember the Truth Social post earlier in the campaign. He didn't just promise revenge on Haley, but he declared that anyone who was donated to her be permanently banned from the MAGA world. So, and especially given what he already posted on Truth Social today, should we expect him to take up uh, her offer and begin moving over toward her, or does he simply expect her to fall into line, uh, as she has in the past, and move over to him? And does that also apply to Mitch McConnell? Is he going to, as Mark Murray and I were talking earlier, is he going to still be revengeful against Mitch McConnell and try to, you know, punish him going forward? Yeah, I think he's expecting her to move to him. I don't think he's going to do anything to reach out to her very uh, explicitly. Uh, I think his experience is that Republicans will come to him, that he doesn't need to actually uh, do anything other than intimidate them, which is what's clearly happened. All these Republicans who said they would never support him again, all these Republicans who said he was unfit for office, all these Republicans who decried his actions on January 6th and the actions after the election of 2020 when he tried to convince the country that he had won when, in fact, he had lost. Mitch McConnell gave the most, you know, uh, vigorous attack on Donald Trump on the day of the Senate impeachment trial finale, even as he voted to acquit him. Uh, he gave the, uh, as tough a speech as any Democrat ever gave, denouncing Donald Trump. And here they all are falling in line. But Donald Trump has said to his associates, they all come and bend the knee in front of him after, uh, after uh, all. And I think that's his expectation, and he has every reason to expect that. Peter, in your book, you explore the way Trump tests loyalty, and one particular passage was really insightful. Um, you write, for Trump, loyalty was something to be received, not given. As 2020 approached, the president regularly asked aides, advisors, even visitors to the White House what they thought of Pence and broached the idea of dumping him from the reelection ticket in favor of Nikki Haley, his former U.N. ambassador. Boy, that seems like ages ago, doesn't it? What more can you tell us, and how have things changed? Yes, how have things changed? I think the idea for uh, Nikki Haley, vice president, was pushed by the Jared Kushner-Ivanka Trump part of the uh, the White House. They thought she would be appealing back then. Uh, they're not involved in this year's race. The reason why Donald Trump gave to some of his aides for not wanting Nikki Haley to be his vice president is he said he didn't like her complexion. And by that, he meant, you know, some sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, markings on her skin that he saw that he found unattractive. I mean, it's not exactly very uh, substantive uh, policy or political considerations here with Donald Trump. He, he makes decisions on the most uh, superficial basis. But I think it's hard to imagine him bringing her back into the fold in a significant way after all of this. What he learned from 2020. Uh, one with uh, Mike Pence is that you can have a vice president who is absolutely 100 percent, 150 percent loyal for th three years and 300 and some days and still then discover that uh, even a Mike Pence will say, no, I'm, uh, there's only so far I'm willing to go. I'm not willing to try to bust the Constitution for you, as he uh, said on January 6th. And I don't think that Donald Trump is going to look at Nikki Haley and think that she's going to be more loyal to him than Mike Pence was. Peter Baker, thank you so very much. Appreciate your time. Back with us, Simone Sanders Townsend, Jennifer Palmieri, Tara Sutmeyer, and Mark Murray. And so, Simone, 
President Biden was quick to release a, a statement saying, in part, quote, Donald Trump made it clear he does not want Nikki Haley's supporters. I want to be clear there is a place for them in my campaign. Is this something that Biden can actually do? Can he capture those voters? Which, truth be told, were very little. Yeah, we're very little. I mean, he went on to say in that statement, we all know this is no ordinary election uh, and the stakes for America couldn't be higher. And then he kind of cribbed that and posted on the, the site formerly known as Twitter that, like, you don't have to agree with me on everything to know MAGA extremists are a threat to this country. The Biden campaign and the president really making a pitch today to say, I don't need you to be with me a thousand percent. I don't need you to be with me 50 percent. I need you to be with me on this one thing, and that's democracy. The Biden coalition in 2020, I think it's Folks know I advised that campaign. I was there. And the coalition that they put together in 2020 was a coalition that included base Democratic voters, independent voters. There were a number of moderate Republicans. We literally had a Republicans for Biden uh, that we rolled out during convention 2020, a Democratic convention. Um, and, and that is the coalition that propel Joe Biden and Kamala Harris to the White House. Uh, that's going to be the coalition he needs again. And I, I think he can get it. But I, I don't think folks should be uh, looking to overcorrect for the Haley voters, if you will. Base Democratic voters are going to be very, very, very important here. Do you think that base coalition is still out there? I, yeah, I, I mean, to be very clear, you do not, you are not a Democrat in this country that gets elected to a national office without base Democratic voters. So it is still there. Uh, I think the support that you see in the polls, the warning signs are that warning signs. This is a snapshot of how people feel at this time. I, I, I do not personally believe that, you know, 27% of black voters are going to vote for Donald Trump. I just, I've been black my whole life, and that's just flies in the face of everything I know. I don't, I, I, I'm also a, a woman, and I've seen what, what he said and what's been happening, and I also doubt the women numbers. But I think that the campaign has to go out there and earn the votes of the base voters, and frankly, that looks like to be what they're trying to do. So, Jennifer, let me ask you about what they need to do in order to do that, because we know that Haley did perform strong with moderate Republicans, with some suburban women, with independents, key constituencies if you want to win the general election. I come out of the the this sort of primary season pretty optimistic about the about Biden's chances. I mean, we don't necessarily I think Steve had a really good point about who are the Haley voters. They could some measure of them are definitely Democrats if they're if 25% of them in Virginia were giving Joe Biden high marks for doing a good job. Um, I think a lot of them are independents. Um, Biden so I, those voters are open to Biden and Biden and the Biden team through analytics is going to be able to figure out who they are and we can the, they're going to be able to message to them on the issues that they know are meaningful to them. Democracy, you know, we're concerned about uh, the court trials that he's uh, that he's going through, classified documents, you know, Jan 6, um, all of that. And um, but, the, you know, one thing that we haven't really talked about that I think is going to be a huge issue Oh, across the, it's abortion. You know, this is the the uh, vote last night was the first post Alabama IVF decision um, time for people to vote. And I know that um, when you talk to uh, uh, Democratic voters in, in in North Carolina, exit poll, so what was most on your mind? Abortion and or GOP uh, voters, and the economy, and yeah, immigration. And, and immigration. But I think that that um, you know, in addition to. Biden being able to argue the job that he has done, that he's got a proof of concept, it's working, he's built a new foundation for the economy. Uh, he has plans for the future. We'll hear about that State of the Union. That, I just, you know, I think it's the most important thing that's happened in the primary season is that decision, because it reminds people, so without Roe v. Wade, you, you can't be certain of any rights. The vice president speaks to this really well. She says, they're going to tell you when to terminate an abortion and if you can start a family. And uh, it was such a big deal in 22, and I think it's going to be, you know, just as uh, meaningful in 24. Ladies, stay with us. Andrea? And Mark Murray, let's talk about November, because it seems so far off as we sit here in March, but November is a lot closer when it comes to getting people's attention. Can the president do that with the State of the Union? Does he have an opportunity there? And he's going to talk about the economy. He's going to talk about foreign policy. He's going to talk about abortion. He's going to talk about IVF. But, you know, how does he galvanize it? And is he prepared to do what he did last year, which was to use the protests and the shouts and the rudeness that was particularly from the far right and turn it to his advantage? Some, 
it could be from some of his own base supporters this time around. Yeah, Andrew, talk about a jam-packed week that we're having with the State of the Union address on Thursday, just two days after Super Tuesday. And it's great timing for President Biden on the State of the Union address, essentially his rebuttal to what we heard from Donald Trump last night after his victories on Super Tuesday. And you're exactly right. Eight months is a very long time. This is going to be a very long general election contest. And what does kind of strike me, and our colleague Chuck Todd wrote about this, the next six weeks, starting with the State of the Union address, but then over the next six weeks, could be end up pivotal for President Biden. He has a huge cash advantage over Donald Trump right now. Do they start using that in TV ads and He's other ways? He's already up in North Carolina. And they've been spending millions and millions of dollars over the last several months, but do they even start spending more and start turning their firepower on Donald Trump right now? Because our last NBC News poll that came out last month showed Donald Trump with substantial leads on who better handles the economy, who better handles foreign policy, who is more competent. And so for President Biden not only to kind of start moving up in the horse race polls uh, against Donald Trump, he's got to actually start kind of leveling off some of Donald Trump's perceived strengths right now. Now, I do think that Donald Trump is has almost this halo effect. He's the challenger right now, despite his record as president from four years ago. However, this is the time in which if you have the cash advantage, if you have the incumbency advantage, you start trying to use that right now. And Jose, we've seen already in this hour so much uh, that is consequential going into these next six weeks with the suspension of Haley's campaign, her repositioning, leaving the door open a little bit, Mitch McConnell endorsing Trump, Trump coming out strong against Haley, and Biden reaching out to the Haley supporters, come with me. And that's in Jose. 55 minutes. <laughs> that, that's just in the last 55 Here minutes. Uh, Tara, <laughs> so let's not, let's turn the page from 55 minutes to the next couple of months. What do you think is going to be the the longest or maybe the among the longest campaigns in history uh, with two very different candidates how do you see these next months going well, I would argue that the campaign never stopped, and it didn't stop for Donald Trump and Republicans, which is partially why Biden has been losing the, the narrative messaging right now, because they've constantly pushed this drumbeat from day one. So now there's the opportunity for the president to get out there and talk to the, It was smart for him to go after the Haley voters right now. It's smart for them to say, listen, we welcome you, and to show that contrast, particularly the women who are the, um, we call them Bannon line women, but they're, the, these are people who are in the Republican Party that need a permission structure to vote Democrat. They need, we need to look at this. You have Mitch McConnell and, and all of these Demo uh, Republicans who know better that had a chance to vanquish Trump falling in line. These folks, these voters need to decide, is this the party they want to be a part of? And there's an opportunity here for Joe Biden and Democrats to go get them, and they will need them to win in the swing states that will decide this election. Simone Sanders Townsend, Jennifer Palmieri, Tara Sutmeyer, and Mark Murray, thank you all so very much. Much more ahead in our next hour of coverage on Nikki Haley's exit from the 2024 presidential campaign. So where do her supporters go? And does this open up for a potential third party? You're watching special coverage here on MSNBC. Stay with us. Seven a.m. Eastern, eight a.m. Pacific. I'm Jose Diaz Boy with another hour of special coverage of the 2024 race for the White House, alongside my friends and colleagues, Ana Cabrera here in New York and Andrea Mitchell live from Washington. And just in the last hour, the contentious Republican battle for the White House officially came to a close. Former President Donald Trump is now the party's presumptive nominee. It comes as former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley suspended her presidential bid just this morning after Trump dominated on Super Tuesday. It is now up to Donald Trump to earn the votes of those in our party and beyond it who did not support him. And I hope he does that. At its best, politics is about bringing people into your cause, not turning them away. And our conservative cause badly needs more people. This is now his time for choosing. Haley ended her historic campaign as the first woman to win a Republican primary contest in the GOP's history, but she only managed to win two races, Vermont and Washington, D.C., after failing to build a coalition large enough to overcome Donald Trump's massive support within the Republican Party. And now, with Haley's exit, November's general election takes shape.
All signs now point to another showdown between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. And joining us now, NBC's Ali Vitali, live from Nikki Haley's campaign headquarters in Daniel Island, South Carolina. NBC News correspondent Von Hillier joins us from West Palm Beach, just outside Mar-a-Lago. Mark Murray, the senior political editor for NBC News, and live from Washington, NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Julie Serkin. So, Ali, what have you heard from the Haley campaign about what went into the decision to drop out today? Jose, I keep hearing this phrase about righteous fights and the idea that this was a just campaign that was on the right side of the Republican Party's history right now. Essentially, the idea that Nikki Haley was offering the party something that wasn't Trump, and now this dropout is the acceptance of the fact that the party said, no, thank you, we're good with what we've had. I do think that you know I often think about these things in the larger arc of political history, especially as it portends to women and executive office. And I think it's really important for us to look at the fact that, as Andrea mentioned, Haley made history in her bid, not just for being one, the only woman who ran in this primary, but also being the first Republican woman to ever win any Republican primaries ever. And she didn't just do that once in D.C. She did that in Vermont last night as well. Of course, we know that that was not enough to get her the nomination. That still remains a stone unturned in the annals of history for women on the Republican side of the parties, but it is substantial and it is notable. I do think there's also research that's worth mentioning, at least in this context of her leaving the race, that historically women who lose elections tend to face a harder road back politically than their male counterparts. Effectively, that's because we are used to seeing men lose when they run, because in most elections, one person wins and one person loses. And over the course of history, more men have, have run than women, so much so on the Republican side that Usually it's the person who comes in second, effectively losing in the primary, who ends up being the nominee the next time around. Because the person in second right now was the woman, I do think it's going to be interesting to see what her political future holds. I also think that the research shows us that voters won't hold a loss against female candidates, but it does depend what they do after. And this may seem like an unfair double standard, but generally voters respond positively to female candidates, at least according to research from the Barbara family foundation that if they're working on behalf of their community as opposed to furthering themselves with high-paying gigs or book deals after voters tend to respond more positively and so it's not just a question of oh will Haley endorse or not but also what does she do after right. leaving this race that's all going to be really important to her future goals do you have any insight into what she plans to do next and and what are you hearing about what it might take for her to endorse Donald Trump she sort of issued that ultimatum here, Anna, basically saying that she is a conservative Republican. She said she has always voted for her party's nominee, and then she proceeded to not endorse the man who is likely to hold that mantle, at least in, a, in an official capacity, just a few nominating contests from now. That is on purpose. Haley knew that she could come out here, endorse, and have the party say they were unified, but the only statement they released last night was saying that this is not a party that's unified just because someone comes out and says it is. That's, of course, what Trump is trying to say here, but Haley has always been quick to point out that even in losing, she's notching 20, 30, maybe even in the New Hampshire case, 40-some-odd percent of the electorate. Yeah, it's not just typical Republican primary voters, but it's independence, and it's why you're watching the Biden campaign say, hey, our tent is big. Come on right along, even as the Trump campaign seems to be dancing on the grave of the Haley campaign and not necessarily extending the olive branch that Nikki Haley challenged him to endorse. I imagine if that changes, politics is transactional after all, and if Nikki Haley sees some kind of political upside, then maybe we could see an endorsement. But I think that it's just as easy for her to say, let's wait till November, see how these results shake out. And then she has a 50-50 shot of being able to say, look, this guy lost, and I told you that would happen. Now can the party move on, please? And Vaughn, uh, Donald Trump spoke out about Haley's exit this morning, uh, first saying that he trounced her, then saying that he wished she'd stayed in the race. Give me the context. Trump thinking behind all that. Right. Donald Trump has not faced any consequence for alienating 
members of the Republican Party to date, right? There are questions around whether alienating the likes of a Liz Cheney would hurt him politically in his presidential run. The answer is clearly no. Instead, you have seen Republicans, including those who have run against him, from Ron DeSantis to Tim Scott, run right back and support him. Because when Ali is talking about the arc of political history here, we see the power dynamics that are at play. And the Republican Party understands that what Republican Party voters want is Donald Trump. Just take the likes of California, where it was closed primary yesterday. Day. Donald Trump is winning by a four to one margin voters there. Independents and Democrats couldn't play in the state. And so you see Donald Trump, literally as Nikki Haley was taking the stage, post on his social media account an enthusiastic all caps trounced to uh, define the loss for Nikki Haley. And I think that the challenge here is that he's already won over Nikki Haley in the past. You know, it was uh, back in 2015 that Nikki Haley was the one on a campaign stage that said, quote, Donald Trump is everything I taught my children not to do in kindergarten. I taught my little ones, you don't lie and make things up. Uh, you know, a couple months later, Nikki Haley was supporting him in his general election and ultimately became his U.N. ambassador. And so for Donald Trump, he hasn't suffered the consequences within the Republican Party of alienating otherwise strong, powerful uh, other elected uh, individuals within it. And the question is, this go around, will it be any different? Because right now, Donald Trump has shown no indication of trying to broaden his reach to the Nikki Haley type voters. Because even if you look at the ballroom inside of Mar-a-Lago, where I was at last, Last night, it was the likes of Roger Stone, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Matt Trump needs the su supporters of. Will they be there and ultimately fall in line and more enthusiastically back his bid against Joe Biden? Does the Trump campaign, Vaughn, think they need Nikki Haley supporters? Uh, the short answer to that is not exactly. I, in fact, asked Marjorie Taylor Greene that question right before the New Hampshire primary explicitly whether Donald Trump needed Nikki Haley, and she told me very explicitly no. And this all comes down to the, the math of how do you become president. And frankly, when you look at places like Arizona, which came down to 11,000 votes, Georgia, which came down to 10,000 votes, they believe that there is untapped Trump enthusiasm among supporters who otherwise didn't vote in 2020. Recall in 2020, he did set the record across the uh, competitive uh, uh, battleground states for a record of Republican nominee to earn votes uh, uh, ever. And so for them, they believe that there's even more supporters that they can come out there and only to a certain extent do they need to win back independence, but by no means do they have to win over the full share that they had lost from 2016. And so Julie, as we've been talking uh, just in the last couple of minutes, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, who recently said he's going to step down as leader, endorse Trump. Oh, do we expect to see others there on Capitol Hill now falling into this line? Certainly. We have already seen it. Even A couple of minutes ago, actually, I came from a press conference among House Republican leadership where they declared at the very start of the press conference that Donald J. Trump is their nominee. They even went as far as to say that he will be the 47th president of the United States. On the other side of the Capitol, though, in the Senate, you mentioned McConnell. No doubt that this is an endorsement he didn't want to make. They had a very tense and rocky relationship, to put it mildly. But in his statement, as part of it, McConnell did point to to some of the few highlights, I want to read you a part of it. He said, quote, during his presidency, we worked together to accomplish great things for the American people, including tax reform that supercharged our economy and a generational change of our federal judiciary. Most importantly, the Supreme Court. Certainly, the courts is a place where McConnell had perhaps the most success in working with Trump and filling that bench. But you also have seen in recent days other members of Senate Republican leadership, like John Thune, for example, who also uh, has had some tense words for the former president, particularly after what happened here on January 6th, come out and endorse him. The only member of Senate Republican leadership so far that has not yet endorsed is uh, Senator Joni Ernst of Iowa. So that is somebody we are still waiting for. But here in the House, you talk about Nikki Haley. For example, Ralph Norman from South Carolina told my colleague Seda this morning he was the <clears throat> only member of the House who endorsed Nikki Haley. So this is important. He said he's 100 percent behind the former president now. He said uh, they need the country to turn around and it is very clear that Republicans up here are falling in line because they see the writing on the wall and they see what is going to happen in November and they hope that the former president can pull it out against uh, President Joe Biden here. And Mark Murray exit polling showed that many Haley voters 
said that they would not commit to voting for the Republican nominee in November. Do you expect that them to also begin following the fold? Uh, this is what time ends up healing a lot of times. And Andrea, you and I have actually covered a lot of races going back to 2008. Remember Barack Obama versus Hillary Clinton? You end up having uh, Hillary Clinton versus Bernie Sanders. The more time you have, the better opportunity you have to actually bring people back in who said that they wouldn't support you. Now, it's important to note the exit polling, I do think, shows some vulnerability signs for former President Donald Trump, including the numbers you just had, where a substantial number of Haley voters saying, I won't support the party's nominee. But a little caution in some of those numbers. Uh, we have actually found good evidence that a lot of the Nikki Haley voters are indeed Democratic or Joe Biden voters. In Virginia, for example, 51% of all Nikki Haley voters said that they approved of Joe Biden's job as president. Those are more likely to be Democratic and Biden voters than they are Republican voters if you decide that you approve of, of Joe Biden and his performance. And so some more warning signs for Donald Trump, some Republicans he has to bring back in the fold. Maybe he hopes time, maybe he hopes overtures, more attacks on Joe Biden. But it's important to note a lot of Nikki Haley's supports in places like Virginia, North Carolina, New Hampshire, South Carolina, were coming from Democrats. And Joe Biden has to decide how to navigate reaching out to those uh, Biden-Haley voters, as well as other you know, mainstream voters who may be anti-Trump, never Trumpers even. And still reaching out to his progressive base, which is where he's got so much troubles for other reasons. Mark, you're sticking around. Ali Vitale, Vaughn Hilliard, Julie Serkin, thanks to you. And coming up, Steve Kordaki is back at the big board to break down where Nikki Haley's voters could go from here. You're watching special coverage right here on MSNBC. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Much more of our breaking news now. Nikki Haley has dropped out of the Republican race for the White House, making Donald Trump the presumptive Republican nominee. And joining us now is Basil Smeichel, a Democratic strategist and the director of the public policy program at the Roosevelt Health Institute of Hunter College. And Susan Del Percio, a Republican strategist and MSNBC political analyst. Thanks, guys, for joining us. So, Susan, you know, Trump wrote on Truth Social today that he would like to, quote, invite all of the Haley supporters to join the greatest movement in the history of our nation. What does he need to do to gain <laughs> the support? Well, he has to stop saying, like, except for Mitt Romney or other Republicans that he calls out all the time, which are exactly the people who voted for Mitt Romney, Donald Trump needs if he's going to win. But that was also after a very ugly statement he made, he's been, or statements he's been making about Nikki Haley. He, he wants the voters because he needs them. He realizes 30 percent of the Republican Party is not with him. So he, he's looking weak, and he's trying to do something there. I don't think it'll hold, frankly. Um, I think he's lost that 30 percent. Well, and actually, Liz Cheney, you could count among that 30 percent. Mm -hmm. She just tweeted, we have eight months to save our republic and ensure Donald Trump is never anywhere near the Oval Office again. So I just wrote for MSNBC.com, my kind of fun takeaway was, can you imagine if Nikki Haley and Liz Cheney got together and to That's stop right. Trump, not necessarily a pro-Biden movement, but to just stop t Donald Trump and talk about the dangers if he is put back in yeah. the Oval Office. Also, how do you see things different today versus yesterday? Well, f specifically for Nikki Haley, it's obviously delega delegate math, and the math isn't math in here. Uh, so she had to drop out. That was obviously expected to Susan's point. I really am focused on what she does next. You know, does she just kind of sit back and do nothing and let the process play out as it should? Or does she team up with uh, a Liz Cheney and find a way to get that 30 percent and figure out how to carry them to 2020, what it was, four years, 2028, um, for when she may run, when she may run again? So I'm really looking at what she does now. But... Joe Biden's also in a great position, having uh, come off, you know, decisive victories yesterday. It is what we expected it should be and would be. So the question is now, how do they each go out and earn the votes of, of the public? Who's in a better position to do that at this point? You know, um, uh, you know, based on what Susan said, and this is a very critical point for any strategist, are you growing your base or are you shrinking it? And Donald Trump has actually been shrinking his base in many respects, largely because of the ongoing controversy 
controversies around reproductive rights and women's health. You know, they're losing support. So the question is, how do they actually, how does he actually gain the support? I think Joe Biden's in a good position to say, hey guys, come on, look, take another look at us, particularly if you're in the suburbs. But he's still got to go out and earn those votes. So that's what I want to see going forward. Andrea? And Susan Del Percio, it depends on whether Donald Trump realizes that he has some vulnerabilities here and that he does have to reach out. But what we've been discussing for the last, you know, more than an hour is his revenge mode, which has really trumped everything, whether it was Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio, everyone fell into line with him, but he didn't always fall into line with them and certainly did not forgive. And certainly today has not been indicating that he's in any case wanting to forgive. Nikki Haley, I think, and Liz Cheney are, are different people. Mm -hmm. very different people, different political animals, because I think that Nikki Haley has been more accommodating, more willing to compromise in the past. Liz Cheney has behaved more according to what she sees as her principles. And I don't see her and Nikki Haley getting together in a Stop Trump movement. Well, again, I kind of threw it out there as, as a what if. And I have my concerns about Nikki Haley as well, Andrea. And that's because... Nikki Haley didn't decisively do anything this morning mm -hmm. except get out of the race. And I can't help but think when she said, like, you're going to have to earn my votes or my, my, the trust of my voters, Donald Trump, she wasn't quite saying, like, and you better have something for me at the end if you want me to deliver them. And I'm not saying a VP choice, but if she was really be believed in the words she has spoken the last six weeks, she would have said... I am not endorsing Donald Trump. She could have made a not endorsement and stood on it. She didn't have to endorse Joe Biden, but right now I just can't help but think she's moving, she's motivated by some maneuvering mm. that she can do towards maybe the convention and have a good primetime spot. In. Uh, Basil, I'm just wondering, one of the things, of the few things that Trump has been consistent on is being inconsistent. And one of the things he's been consistent on is being unconventional, even in the world of politics. How do you see these next months going when you have two clearly different campaigns, ca candidates, but with someone who is so unconventional and who is completely against the grain of what politics traditionally has been. Well, that's why I take Joe Biden's points from, I think it was yesterday, when he said um, the goal from now on is to go after Donald Trump and expose the, I think he called, he said that he was intellectually and emotionally wobbly. <laughs> and I don't know if that's a scientific term, but it's a great way to sort of really look at the strategy going against Donald Trump. Bring out, you know, that those inconsistencies, if he is not ideological in any very specific way, Call attention to that. Call attention to the hypocrisy. I, I think that's actually a really good strategy. And I would also add the days of, with all due respect to the Obamas, the days of when they go low, we go high are over. And they have been over for quite some time. You cannot bring a book to a knife fight. This is a street fight going into, uh, into November. And unless the Democrats are awake to that, and I think they are, but the Democrats have to be awake to that because there is no playing nice uh, with the other side, there's too much at stake. Basil Smeichel, Susan Del Percio, always great to have your perspective. Thank, Thank you, you for the conversation. Up next, our Steve Kornacki is going to break down where Nikki Haley voters go now. Plus, could a third party be in play in 2024? We'll ask former New Jersey Governor Christine Todd Whitman just that. You're watching special coverage only on MSNBC. And welcome back with our breaking news. Former Governor Nikki Haley just dropping out of the presidential race after former President Trump dominated in Super Tuesday states last night. Jose? Now voters who backed Haley will have to decide who to support this November, which is essentially a Trump-Biden rematch. Here's what a, a few of them told NBC News they do if Haley left the race. You know, that's a really good question. I would... I... <laughs> It's probably going to be Biden just because it's been, you know, four years and and he hasn't uh, divided, <laughs> you know, he hasn't he hasn't caused other countries to hate us like Trump did. I'm uh, I'm I'm a little concerned with Trump, but at the same time, uh, if it's between Trump and Biden, then it's uh, I'd probably vote for Trump. 
Joining us now is NBC's Steve Kornacki at the Big Board. Steve, you've been obviously digging into the numbers, to the exit polling, to the specific areas that are going to be key for the general election. Where do Nikki Haley's voters go? Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a good question that's worth considering, I think, from a couple of different angles, because we've been talking about this in the coverage the last couple of days, and that is a lot of the Haley support, there's a lot of strong evidence in these states, has just come from the fact that a lot of the primaries allowed for Democrats and Republicans to participate. And I think one of the big factors in Haley's support in some of these states we've seen has been independents and Democrats who strongly dislike Donald Trump and are already uh, willing to vote for Joe Biden over him and probably did vote for Joe Biden over him in 2020, just taking what's essentially a free opportunity to vote against Trump again in these primaries. So I think that's a meaningful chunk of the vote that Haley's gotten. I'm not sure that's available to Trump at all, potentially. There's also a big chunk the exit polls have shown of Haley's voters who say they will ultimately get in line with Donald Trump. So I think that leaves, it, there is a group out there, I, I'm sure, and it's very hard to quantify what it is, but there there is a group out there, I'm sure, uh, of Haley voters who could be winnable for Donald Trump. What it would take for him to do it, uh, I'm not sure. But I think there's a, it's a small size. And if you're thinking in terms of what the Trump campaign might be thinking here strategically, do they go after them? How do they go after them? Do they not go after those voters? Here's the context that the Trump campaign would be making that decision. And I just want to show you a couple of, uh, uh, of graphics here. So start with this. Just in the last uh, few days, we've had four major national polls come out doing a Trump-Biden rematch match trial heat. And in all of them, you can see here, the margins are small, but in all of them, Trump is ahead of Joe Biden in the polling. And that's a big change. From 2020, there wasn't a single poll in 2020, a credible national poll, that ever put Trump ahead of Biden. Just in the last few days, there have been four that have Trump up. So I think the Trump campaign feels, relatively speaking, that they're operating from a position of strength right now. Also, on that question of within the Republican Party, do these primary results, do Haley's showings in these Republican primaries indicate that there's a big fracturing of the Republican Party that jeopardizes Trump in the fall? Here again are the kinds of numbers the Trump campaign is looking at as they think about how to deal with that strategically. This is the Republican vote in these polls from the last few days that I'm showing you, just asking Republican voters. Trump's getting 91, 92, 96, depending on the poll. That's absolutely in line. In, in, in 2020, he got 94% of the Republican vote in the general election. In 2016, when he won, he got 92% of the Republican vote. So the numbers he's posting in general election polling against Biden right now are absolutely consistent with what he's got among Republicans in past elections. So again, if you're, if you're looking at the primaries and saying, boy, there's all evidence here of Republicans turning on Trump, unwilling to vote for Trump in the fall, you're not seeing it in the general election polling in these Trump numbers. Uh, and then you take a look at one final thing here. This is from the New York Times Siena poll. They looked at it this way. They asked respondents in their poll, who did you vote for in 2020 and are you still with that candidate now? 97% of folks who said they voted for Trump in 2020 say in this poll they're still with Trump, but only 85% of Joe Biden's 2020 voters say they're with him. So again, I think if you're the Trump campaign, you look at a finding like this and say, Maybe there's some slack on the Republican side, they're probably thinking, but not a ton. And meanwhile, it's Biden who has the slack. And the reason Trump is leading in these polls right now uh, over Biden and their polls, they can change and they can be wrong. And all of the uh, all of the disclaimers we can put on it. But I think the Trump campaign would look at this and say they're picking off Biden voters right now more than Biden is picking off Trump voters. So I, I think those are the things that go into their thinking uh, in terms of how to approach this Haley question uh, strategically. I think they'd be asking that question about exactly how many of these voters are gettable, what would it take to get them? And then they're saying, are, there, are, are they making gains elsewhere that could offset whatever they're potentially losing here? And like I say, just looking at the numbers right now, and again, only poll numbers, but I think that informs some of the decision making and some of the strategic thinking here. And I'm just thinking, Steve, because if we look at how the polls were in 2016, all of them wrong. All of them telling us that, uh, you know, Secretary Clinton was going to be the winner. Most polls were saying that for the longest time. And of course, it didn't happen that way. What has changed since 216 and 220 is enthusiasm, is the different, are the different issues that have come up, abortion being probably the main one, thinking about immigration. What are some of the differences 
that this political season has to the 2016 and to the 2020. Uh, yeah, you mentioned some of the issues, but I think the big thing hanging over this that's just different from four years ago, and I think goes potentially a long way to uh, explaining the kinds of poll results we're seeing is Biden's the incumbent now. Biden was the challenger in 2020. And when you're the challenger, you do have a bit of an advantage when the mood of the country isn't, uh, it isn't as optimal as it could be. And all of the polling out there right now shows you know, the country's still in a pessimistic place when it comes to the economy. As you say, the country has huge concerns when it comes to the border. There's a lot of issues right now that have voters not feeling great about where the country is. And in that kind of environment, I don't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat, whoever you are, if you're the incumbent president, a lot of that frustration, a lot of that apprehension ends up getting turned on you. And if you're the challenger, that gives you new opportunities to pick up votes simply because they don't want the incumbent anymore. Trump suffered from that in 2020. Biden may right now be taking a hit from that same dynamic. Steve Kornacki, thank you so very much, my friend. Bye. Appreciate it. Always oh, so interesting to he get really into the, the details there. Joining us now is former Republican governor of New Jersey, Christine Todd Whitman. She is also the co-chair of the Forward Party. Thank you so much for joining us, Governor. You know, based on what we've just heard, where do Haley voters go now, especially those independent voters, as it appears the GOP is fully Trump's party? Oh, I think they're going to take a little time to think. But I, I think a majority of them, I believe a majority of them are going to go for Biden at the end of the day. I mean, the one good thing, and that it also throws off all those numbers, is we're a long way from November. And as you know, in politics, a week is a year. So a lot can happen in that. But most of these uh, Haley voters are people who just don't like the kind of atmosphere that Donald Trump creates. They don't like the fact, as one of the people that you had, you interviewed, was interviewed, said, you know, I, the other countries don't hate us. Uh, Joe Biden has been able to hold that together. But the economy is the big thing. It is doing well, except when you look at rural America where the jobs have not come back because technology has taken so many of them away and they blame Biden for that. And, you know, if you're the incumbent, you get blamed whether it's your fault or not. Um, that's just what happens. You get the credit if you didn't do anything, but it turns out to be good while you're in office and you get the blame, um, even if you didn't have anything to do with it. So there's a lot that has to happen to get people to recognize where we really are and what the damage to this country could be caused if, Donald Trump is reelected. And Governor Whitman, Andrea Mitchell here, I just want to get your thoughts on the fact that there is so much negativity among voters to both of these, the presumptive candidates in both parties. Is this ripe for a third party candidate, you know, for no labels or some other movement? Um, and of course, depending well, on who that person would be, yeah. it, it would depend on whether it would end up you know, hurting Biden more than Trump or Trump more than Biden? Well, that's a, that's a big question. And I don't think anybody knows. And as you say, it's going to depend on who the candidates are. But that's why what we're doing with Forward becomes even more important, because no matter who wins this election, we know it's going to be close and we know there are going to be lawsuits. And so it becomes increasingly important to ensure that at the local level and the state level, at the governor, the secretary of state, the attorney general, your local commissioners are people who will respect the rule of law and protect the ballot. However it comes out, make sure that they protect it and that they will stand up against the kind of lawsuits we've seen in the we saw after the 2020 election lawsuits based on absolutely nothing. And it took only a few. It was we hung on by a thread to our democracy there because there were a few people who were willing to stand up and say, I'm sorry, uh, this is what the vote is. I may not like it. You may not like it, but that's where it is. And, and I cannot do anything other than certify that. So it becomes really important to ensure that we have that. And, and we are building a third party, but we're building it from the ground up. And it's not a party that's going to tell people where they have to be on a particular issue. You don't have to be pro-choice or anti-choice. We'll, we'll support Republicans, Democrats, and independents where we're not on the ballot. And we are on the ballot in five states. Um, but where we're not on the ballot, we'll support the others as long as they agree with the principles of the party, which are uphold the rule of law, respect the Constitution, work with anyone to ensure that we start to solve problems and represent their people, not some party, not what the party tells you you have to think and say, but what your constituents want and need and what your state or your locality want and need. Governor, I'm just thinking back on the, on the that 
kind of interesting phrase that you coined, which is in politics, every week is a year, and we've got probably the longest general presidential elections and certainly in recent history coming up. So we're talking about the equivalent of, of decades right, in the world of politics. And so much is happening in just such a short period of time. And I'm just thinking here going forward, just through the summer, we've got elections in, in Mexico. We've got the disaster uh, that is going on in Venezuela with Maduro. We have Haiti that is pretty much a, 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 a place where there is no government. There are so many foreign crimes crises that we don't even know about that are going to be happening. Mm -hmm. What do you think those different crises are going to have as far as an impact on us here? Well, I mean, first of all, for the ones that you cited from Latin America, from South America, Central America, obviously you're going to see more people trying to flee those countries. Um, and that's going to put pressure on the border. And we need a border policy, but that's Congress. And that's what's so frustrating. Um, immigration, as you've said, and as Steve has said, is one of those big issues. It, it should be. But you have a proposal, bipartisan proposal, in the Congress that could be passed, except that Donald Trump says don't do it because he wants it for this campaign. And that's just inexcusable because that's hurting real people. I mean, there are lives being lost. There are businesses being lost. There are dislocations across the country. And because of politics, we're not solving the problem. And both, by the way, both sides have done this kind of thing in the past, but this is so blatant because you have a bipartisan bill that's ready to move forward and was ready to move forward until he said, don't do it. And of course, if we wait until the election, uh, Vladimir Putin could defeat <laughs> Ukraine as well, to say nothing of what's right. happening in Gaza. In uh, former Gaza. Governor Christine Todd Whitman, it's great to see you. Thank you so much. Good to see you. And all. up next, Chuck Todd joins us with why he says the next six weeks are so critical, a critical stretch for the presidential campaign. Stay with us. We'll be right back on MSNBC. Welcome back. Nikki Haley's departure from the presidential race effectively makes Donald Trump the presumptive Republican nominee and sets up a rematch with Joe Biden this fall. And with us now to talk more about all of this and politics in general, the, the general election as we look ahead is NBC News chief political analyst Chuck Todd. So, Chuck, thanks for coming in. Of course. Just, I want to get your reaction first to the big news this morning, Nikki Haley dropping out of the race. So I, I don't think it's surprising, and I don't think it's surprising how she positioned herself here. And I think that the question, though, that I think is still an unknown is, you know, and I don't think she said I think what she said is she's right, that Trump should be <laughs> earning her support and earning her supporter support. But I don't know if Trump's going to go after her voters, right? Just a couple of days ago, he said, we're get, we've gotten rid of the Romneys. We're, we don't want the moderates. And yet, the difference between him winning or losing may be this small slice of moderate voter here. Then if you look at it from the perspective of Nikki Haley, her future, you know, for, you know the, her future, is, I think, is predicated on Trump losing the general, right? Like, she needs, she, in order to make her case, you know, if she wants to be the I told you so Republican, he's got to lose the general. So... I think she's in a in a in an um, an awkward point in her own political career, because her few political future really is tied to to Trump's political demise. Andrew has a question for you. Of course. Yeah, Chuck, I'm wondering about Liz Cheney because mm -hmm. I think she's a very different character mm -hmm. uh, and has behaved more on principle, frankly, than Nikki Haley has in the world of politics. Mm -hmm. Just speaking of, she's been more consistent. Um, what does she do now, given that she put out a very strong statement against Trump, uh, saying that she wanted to do anything possible to stop him from becoming president again? You know, it's interesting. I've talked to some people very close to her, and I know that, you know, she, she doesn't want to be John Kasich, right? Which, and I, and I say this, meaning Kasich went and spoke at the Democratic Convention. Um, and I think, you know, and, and look, Kasich was at a different stage of his political career. Um, but there, it's hard for him to come back, right, as leader of a new conservative movement in, in some ways once you do that. And I think my understanding is that, that, that I think Cheney sees that as sort of like that's a bridge too far. That doesn't mean she doesn't advocate a vote for Biden. That doesn't mean she doesn't advocate. You know, can she play the role of, hey, I want to build a new conservative movement, but we can't build this movement until Trump is gone? Um, you know, if she's playing an out, I think she's more of an asset to stopping Trump if she's on the outside than if she's trying to be part of the Biden coalition, if that makes sense, Andrea. 
Yeah, and, just, and, and Chuck, I mean, I mean, if if Trump even thinks he has a Trump coalition or it's all Trump, and if you're not Trump, I don't need you. Yeah. It's something that he has had in the past. I mean, clearly, 2000. Uh, 16, right. you know, he said, like, this is where I stand, uh, you know. The, the, By the way, hasn't it worked? That's, that's, I mean, it I, didn't work the, in the midterms. It but didn't it work has in, worked in that, in this respect. His base has grown, meaning has the Trump base has grown. It doesn't mean the party has grown. The party has shrunk, right? The Republican vote share has shrunk. Trump's connection to the Republican base is deeper than ever before, True. right? So in that sense, he really has, this is Trump's party. In 16, he had that attitude, and he had a lot of people that had to do this because they didn't, they didn't think they liked him, but they had an open Supreme Court seat, right? right? And that's what they cared about. There, there's nobody holding their nose this time. I think the question is, Donald Trump's got the same number that he got the last time. And he's going to get the same number this time. But is 47% a winning number or a losing number? It depends on voter turnout, Correct. right? Correct. It depends on who's on the ballot also. Right? Are there third party candidates taking away a vote here? Vote? We know he cannot win 50%, but that doesn't have to be his winning number. The question is, is 47 a winning number? And that goes to, all right, how effective is the Biden coalition? And how much, how much damage do the third party candidates do to his vote share? I, I want to ask you about this new piece that you mm -hmm. had on NBC.com. I think it's this still there. Before, well, I'm, I'm, what I wanted to say is mm -hmm. you had it out there even before Nikki Haley dropped mm -hmm. out as you were already right. looking at the math. The math is the math, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Super Tuesday. And you are talking right. about the next six weeks being yeah. a very critical stretch in the general election. And here's why it is. Because if you look at previous incumbent successes... It is the period of time when the challenger has been coronated. I think John Kerry and Mitt Romney being two of two recent examples. And in that coronation period, that they were it was some of their best days. But it was the Bush campaigns, you know, the infamous Swift boats, you know, back then, that, you know, with Kerry. And it was at a time Kerry was low on cash and he couldn't really respond. Mitt Romney. He was low on money during his campaign. And that's when they went after Bain and his business record. And it took him a while. To, and so the point is, Biden has a period of time. This six weeks, Trump is broke, campaign cash, he, comparatively to Biden. Biden has this huge financial advantage. He has an opportunity here to frame the campaign messaging against Trump, almost unresponded to. How does he use this six weeks? This is why I say it's a really crucial six weeks because Biden has this built-in advantage right now. And so if you're Biden uh, and Biden folks, how do you use these six weeks? That's because what I'm curious about. Look, I, how much, and this is going to be the debate they have. Is it television? How, well, of course it's TV ads, but how much is it do you look backwards and how much do you look right. forwards, right? How much do you run against Trump's presidency or how much do you run ag against what Trump's second term could look like? And, I, you know, look, I think you're going to see a lot of abortion, right? That more than anything else because that's something Biden didn't have in 2020. Right, because of Dobbs. Now he does, but I think I'm, I, I don't. I think you see a lot of January 6 and a lot of abortion. I don't know what else you'll see because I think it's very hard to go backwards and make people remember the Trump years because we memory hold everything because of COVID. Right, so COVID has conflated like our, you know, like we, exactly. And and you know, think about your own life right. and how much you've like yeah. COVID just sort of. So it's a. They, I think they have to run against what Trump's going to do versus <clears throat> what he did. Well, you are coming back, so we're going to hit pause soon. and right. continue the conversation here Chuck, Todd, in the next you. hour. Thank you. Check Appreciate Todd. it. And up next, the very latest reporting on what went into Nikki Haley's decision to today suspend her campaign. Stay with us. We're back with our breaking news. Nikki Haley out of the presidential race. And joining us now is NBC News campaign embed, Greg Hyatt, who has been very closely covering Haley for months now. Greg, your top takeaways from this moment and what happens next? Hey, good afternoon. So really what this comes down to is Governor Haley was always going to be willing to fight for her supporters. She always talks about on the campaign trail that there's a 30 to 40 percent of the GOP electorate that love Nikki Haley and that see the current state of the Republican Party and are wondering where is the party going next under Trump as he now becomes the essential nominee on the GOP side. So really for Governor Haley today, the decision to decide to step away from the race really comes down to giving a 
of voice to those supporters who have been turning out at all of her Super Tuesday rallies consistently. I've pretty much gone to everywhere she's been over the last couple of weeks, and you're seeing a lot of enthusiasm. You see a lot of big crowds who would encourage her consistently to continue that fight. So, Haley, today, at, the, at this point, really you start to get to that delegate math, as we saw with the performance of former President Trump on Super Tuesday last night, and that's really where the timing gets into bowing out now. As far as where do we go next, listen, Governor Haley has stated herself that she's not going to look at a third party. She's not looking at no labels. She has stated that directly. I would anticipate that Governor Haley is going to continue to fight for the issues that she is very passionate about. You heard her talk about it in the speech, such as the national debt, such as term limits in Congress, America's importance on the global stage. She'll continue to do that. She'll just do it from the sidelines. Greg Hyatt, thank you so very much. It's good to see you. Coming up, we're going to get reactions to Nikki Haley's exit from a Biden campaign spokesman. Stay with us for more special coverage right after a quick break.